Welcome everybody, thank you for being here. Uh, some of you were here already for the first part of the meeting. I see some new faces. It's exciting to get a lot of the community here with us too. Uh, I know that the setting is a little awkward, but we're trying to be able to be hybrid. We have some people online and be able to see you. As if at any time I'm not really paying attention to you, please let one of my board members know so that I can call to you. We're gonna get started. And I'm going to do the same opening that we did for our, our finance committee, just to get us in the tone for this meeting. So I apologize to the other members that were already part of that. But uh, we were using today uh, at the word of the day, and it was perseverance. And it's a steady persistence in a course of action, a purpose, or, a, or especially in spite of difficulties or obstacles. So what we were talking about is that in the past, in the past few years, we have overcome uh, in remarkable and unprecedented challenges as a district. Whether it was the pandemic, whether it was consolidation, whether it was any of those things that were thrown at us, uh, I, I believe that uh, we for sure can pursue and lead Washington Central Unified Union District in, to the new era and trying to think about community in a, you know, in a, in a bigger way and trying to think about making our schools, a, our, our Washington Central District, uh, one system that serves best uh, all of our students. And in that spirit, uh, to achieve educational equity will, uh, that will consider the experience, opportunities, and best outcomes with that broader sense of community. And the last thing I would say is that um, what this all reminded me was the quote from Nelson, Nelson Mandela that says, it always seems impossible <coughs> until it's done, and then it seems inedible. So the reason to bring that up today is because we we're going to be talking about budget. And I know that a lot of us are feeling like, oh my god, <laughs> really big. But I think that we are able to do really great things. And I'm excited to open this meeting. We're going to have a budget presentation. We're going to have plenty of time for the community to give us input to. And then the board will do the meeting. So with that, let's move into any adjustments to the agenda. Go ahead. Well, I just noticed that there's sort of an overlap between 6.4 and 5 oh. and 8.1. Yeah, we're not gonna. We, yeah, we'll. We have to consolidate it. It's just gonna be part of more operations. You're talking about okay. the budget yep. part. Yep. So we're gonna be part of that, and that's why there's just 15 minutes. To okay. Get to the back. Is that okay? Yeah. Are there any public comments that are not related to budget that somebody wants to make before we get started? I don't see any. Do you see any hands, Mark? I don't have any. Okay. So then we're going to move into yep. the budget presentation. Mark, do you have the slides up? everyone. Um, as usual, we will share a lot of information. There will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. We also have a leadership team here who can answer questions as well. Um, we're here to share with you the first draft budget. Um, and we always take a minute to review where we are in the budget 
on a development process, and I think it's important for us to also share with you, um, as you know, we made a change to the budget process this year to give the board uh, budget assumptions earlier in the process so that we could also bring budget recommendations earlier in the process. We just want to make sure that you know that we really felt that as we went in between the community forum and this meeting to pull together the budget. Um, typically, we are giving you budget recommendations at that December meeting, um, and so it's taken quite a bit of uh, kind of scrambling, to, frankly, to, to bring this to you. And also, there are more changes that you see to numbers because of how early we gave you that assumption. So some of what you're going to see tonight is reflective of changes that happened between those budget assumptions and today. We did this for a really good reason, and I'm not, I don't want us to second guess why we did this. It's just an awareness piece. Um, so tonight, you're going to hear a first draft budget. You're going to have an opportunity to uh, react to that, ask questions, give input. There will be another budget meeting on December 20th. Uh, based on this timeline, January 17th is when you will have another budget meeting and finalize your budget for approval to meet our warning timelines and obviously the annual meeting and town meeting day. We vote. This is our agenda. Um, so, oh, thank you, Flora. We have copies of the slides. One of, one of the pieces of this is we work on it down to the wire. So here's a hard copy for folks and there okay. are actually one of the audience members. These also will be posted on the website, so for those on the screen or anyone who wants to access it electronically. Thank you, Floor. So first we're going to start, as we usually do, with what is it you are, our community has asked us to support? What does this budget need to provide for students? We'll talk a little bit about enrollment, some student information, and education quality. Some of this you've seen before, so we won't take a lot of time. Then we're going to tell you about the changes we're, recommenda we're recommending to you in this first draft that helps us achieve your parameters and our district goals. And then we'll talk about the budget proposal and the costs associated with that. So you've seen this quite a bit before. I'm not going to spend time on it. This is version 3.0 of our core beliefs. But we ground our budget work in what is it we're trying to do for students. This is related to our strategic plan. And you're also familiar, Mark, that clicker is not working. Did you click off? I think you clicked off the slides. Uh, there sorry. you go. Thank you. Um, these are our three pillars. We talk about these quite a bit. These guide the work within our school. So we talk about these a lot with our staff. Um, again, it's all of this that this budget will support. So I want to... Careful where you click, Mark. Because <laughs> you're in this. I don't think you're doing it on purpose. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how we engage um, folks related to this budget. Um, obviously, we already know as a district there are things we have to do that we're already working on. This is our required work. This is implementation of new statewide requirements. Um, this is our long-time focus on lifting all students. Um, it's our district work. That always exists. Um, when we think about how we engage our staff, we've done this a little bit different this year. We reflect on this process every year. Um, we, this year, are providing more regular budget updates to staff after every budget meeting. They have had a staff thought exchange. We've always had surveys in the past. We also, this year, are trying out a budget ambassador structure, which has uh, a member from each school who sits down with central office before each budget meeting. Those conversations have been really helpful. It's very organic because we're building that process as we go. Um, and we will continue to meet with them. So uh, community, we've talked a lot this year about how do we engage students and, and kind of lift student voices. So there's a couple of different places that we've done that. Um, this happened last year where I met with members of the student council, but it was later in the process. So we've started meeting earlier. They get the same budget updates that we give staff. Um, and so there's a connection there. Obviously in November, you all held your community input. Um, you, we sent a survey out on your behalf. 
um, and we're having this budget meeting. So uh, in December, we'll have another budget meeting. And then um, the board, your opportunity to see the budget this year before January is those two dates. And we wanted to share some themes. Mark, can you do me a favor and move that? I can't see the oh, bottom. The folks in the room can't see the bottom yeah, of that. Sorry, um, let me try. Um, thank you. And maybe not. Yeah, all the way up. Yeah. Maybe all the way up. It might not be that. Yeah, there we there go. go. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so if we merge all of that data, there's a lot of themes. And these are some of the themes that I think are important to share with you because the leadership team thought a lot about this in addition to their own work as they started planning. So we know our community cares deeply for our schools and they want to make sure we have what we need to educate students. That comes out really clearly in all of our feedback. Um, they really want to make sure that our kids, there's themes in this first bullet that are similar to our strategic planning themes. Um, our communities value belonging, they want to make sure our kids' social emotional needs are met, they want to make sure that we expand engagement with the community, <coughs> support the wellness of students. They really recognize the intersection of school and community, our staff are our community members in many cases. Um, there's a pretty significant theme in all of the feedback on making sure we maintain opportunities for students. Um, center student programming. Uh, there is an openness in the feedback on, in all of those settings to consideration of different structures in order to ensure that we can provide those robust opportunities. Um, there's a strong support for our humanity and justice work. Um, and in terms of learning, just feedback around making sure we have the staffing we need in the critical mass class sizes. Um, talk a lot about quality workforce and continuing our student support systems. So those are themes across all of the input. And Mark, you gotta click on the slide again so my clicker works, sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, you're familiar with this board. These are your budget parameters. I know that you are going to come back around to at least one of those parameters. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how the leadership team approached this, um, given our discussions and our input. But one of the pieces of your, or one of the parameters that you've given us is, these are the three lenses that we look through when we are building a budget. Okay. So because we, you'll see later in the slides that we've really centered our decision making around quality programming and enrollment, responding to enrollment, I'm gonna give you a little bit of information here. Board, you've seen this information before, some of this information before. As you know, we ground our work in the education quality standards. Um, that is Vermont rule. If you care to look at it, there's links in the slides. Uh, for both the current and proposed version. We know that they are undergoing some revisions. There are not changes in those revisions to the pieces that we look at here related to budget, so staffing ratios and things like that. And this is Vermont's definition of appropriately resourced schools for quality education. That's why um, we use it and that's why you choose to use it as a measure. Um, it also gives us some more consistent guidelines. You have seen this chart before, so I won't spend much time here. This is a, our enrollment by school, looking back and looking forward. Um, and one of the key things that we looked at when we built this budget is how do we respond to the fact that we are educating fewer students now than we were a number of years ago, and we continue to expect to educate fewer students, at least in the immediate future. This is a new slide, at least this year, you saw it last year. Um, our average K-3 class size is 14, that range is nine to 22. Um, education quality standards are measured by <coughs> averages. So they look at is the average uh, class size in those grade bands below those numbers. So our average of 14 is well under ed quality standards of 20 for grades K-3, and our average of 16 in grades 4 through 12. Yes, that's a strange span, but that's how they define it. 
and they would look for those class sizes to be less than 25. It's quite a big range, as you can see, for that 4 through 12 number. Some of that has to do with um, highly specialized courses that by nature and definition have a small number, so that's your range. Um, but those are our averages. This is a big chart. You've looked at it last year, and the print is small, uh, so hopefully copies made their way around. Um, but you've seen this before. This is how we compare to Vermont education quality standards. Um, I'll give a little bit of a second so that you can review it, but the theme is that we are well below education quality standards, meaning um, we are more than sufficiently resourced in the area of personnel in each of these. There is always time to go back and answer questions later. So the next few slides are going to show the board what's included in this first draft budget. And again, this is what we are recommending that we do in the context of the budget realities that we have in order to serve our students in our current configuration. And you're going to hear me say that several different times because the budget you're going to see uh, has a significant cost increase, uh, and we'll kind of walk you through that. Um, we'll be talking about changes that we made that we believe support better programming for students. Um, that was where we started our leadership team conversations. Um, and then you are going to see changes that are specifically related to enrollment. Um, and so we're going to walk you through that, and then Suzanne will walk you through a lot of numbers and then we'll have time for questions. So the first thing that we did, so you, you know, your several slides ago, your budget parameter, um, your original parameter had two, two things related to finance. One was to try to match the October inflation rate, which you all acknowledged was a soft target once you saw the baseline budget. And then you had a parameter around avoiding the tax rate review, which is Act 127's new version of a spending threshold, for lack of a better word. Um, but there's a lot of distance in between that budget parameter, so we needed to give ourselves some direction as an administration. And here's some of the things we talked about, and then I'm going to talk about how they changed, because even the numbers in this slide have changed. But we knew from the beginning that our goal is to make sure we have enough resources for robust student programming in our current configuration. You are going to see some recommendations for changes, but not large-scale configuration changes. Um, and, and we'll talk about kind of why that is. Um, we, we, we want to be clear that that parameter, that option one, would be significant reduction. So um, at the time that we were looking at it, this number would be even bigger now, but that's about a three, little over a $3 million decrease if we were to try to reach an inflation level budget. Um, so then we talked about different things that we could look at. Um, sometimes districts say if you could just bring that under 10%, so under double digits. So we talked about what that parameter is. We talked about trying to align the increase to kind of workforce cost increases. Um, and you can see that increase. Uh, where we landed, quite frankly, is um, that threshold of keeping us below what would trip us into a tax rate review because frankly it's the most conservative one and what we found and what you are well aware of is we currently run a configuration that is costly to run and if we were to cut and cut and cut in our current configuration it would start to impact student programming and that's not a place the administration wanted to be. So the, the changes we're going to propose, they are, there are reductions. There are absolutely reductions that we believe preserve our expanded student <coughs> programming and take into consideration our enrollment changes. Um, and you're going to see that it does not um, hit your parameter. And that's the information we want to share with you today. So said a different way, once we picked what number we were aiming for as a leadership team, we still had to figure out how we were going to approach that. I already talked about the first bullet. Um, this year, which is different than last year, and this is based a lot um, on the feedback we got from staff 
uh, our budget um, ambassadors also talked about this. Our schools are different, and we wanted to make sure individual schools could make decisions about reductions based on their situation, so long as we are not moving anyone out of education quality standard range. And the two pieces of direction we gave is to make an attempt. We already know our ESSER bunny is going away, so that was a try to reduce offer reductions related to how much money you currently receive from ESSER. And then enrollment related reductions. Just are you, if you are serving fewer students, what does that mean for your budget? So again, responding to enrollment changes while staying within ed quality standards. So I'm gonna go through the next several slides because these are the highlights of the changes. And um, I'll get through them all. Your leadership team is here to be able to answer questions and give you more information, which you may need. But um, kindergarten numbers between Jody and Romney are projected to be very small next year. Small enough that we don't feel like a class of seven and a class of six by themselves would be good programming for students. Um, so the proposal is to combine Jody and Romney kindergarten into a single class. We would like some more time to talk about where that class is located. Um, but it would be a single class, and that would be a net budget reduction from both of those schools, essentially, of 1.0 FTE classroom teacher. Uh, board should know in general, reductions, you know this, you've heard us say this before, we have preliminary conversations with potentially impacted people. We never really know who is impacted until later in the process. Second piece related to enrollment, is about pre-K at Jody and Romney. So similarly, small numbers um, and each of these age groups. And so the proposal is to combine Jody and Romney pre-K, one program that still runs two sessions, and be able to pair it more consistently with community connection so that there's full day care available. That's something that's hard to do right now because we don't have enough numbers to justify the child care part. So there would be more consistency for that after school component. Um, this is not a huge net budget change. It does allow us to reduce a, a paraprofessional, a partial paraprofessional, because of the numbers once combined. So that is a proposal. So budget changes outside of those two, we kind of pulled out those kindergarten and pre-K because they're very specific. Um, the rest of these are really the proposals coming from that individual work with buildings. Uh, you can see this total spending decrease, you'll see this on two slides because it took two slides to say this, um, is about $890,718. So that's a significant amount of money. That's almost $900,000. You'll also see that that doesn't hit the target, um, but we'll talk about that in a second. We believe that these changes still allow robust programming. We believe they're related to enrollment. Reductions are related to enrollment. And in some cases, we are looking to serve students differently. So in Berlin, there is a net reduction of a classroom teacher based on enrollment. There is a reduction of a school counselor and an addition of a BCBA position. You're familiar with that position in this case because we are applying, actually we've received, that's an update, Project Serve money. Um, the reason that says 0 0.5 is because Project Serve um, is a 12-month grant. So it will fund that position roughly halfway through next year. So this budget needed to fund, find the money to fund it through the rest of that year. There's a net reduction of a classroom teacher at Ace Montpelier related to enrollment. In Calais, there's reduction, partial reductions in these areas library media, school counselor, math intervention, and school nurse. Doty, partial reductions in nurse and counseling. You can see in some buildings it's very clear the ESSER connection, in other buildings it's not. Rumney, reduction of paraeducators, and there's a reduction of a school-wide behavior professional. Um, that's a Medicaid-funded position, but we want to make sure that there's an awareness of this. U32, similar to Berlin, 
Um, there is a reduction of a school counselor and an addition of an SAP counselor, that's a substance, a substance abuse professional. Um, we are seeking grant funding through this um, to partially fund that, and there's a reduction of two paraeducators. A lot of information there. I'm going to keep us plugging through. Suzanne's going to share numbers, and we will be able to flip back and forth if people have questions in the middle through that. I may read notes a little more than Megan does. <laughs> uh, so this slide is a reminder of the factors impacting the budget. Many of these items have been on our list of realities for multiple years now. As we anticipated the sunset of our ESSER funds, uh, the further declining enrollment we anticipated, rising costs, and changes to Vermont Ed funding. Uh, implications of Act 127, it's legislation that becomes effective with this budget. Uh, it is a change in the long term, in, a change in the weighting of our pupils. It, instead of equalized pupils, it becomes long term weighted average daily membership. We are in a scenario where it is favorable to our tax rate and overall increases across the state will impact the yield and negate some of that favorable benefit in the tax rate from Act 127. So what that means is we don't currently know the property yield. We don't currently know what our pupils will be this year. What we know is the change that this formula <laughs> created in last year's pupil number was significant enough that we're projecting a sizable decrease in the tax rate. The final property yield is not set by the legislature until after the budget is actually passed by voters. Well, sorry, actually voted on at town meeting. It's when legislature is done and settled. If, yeah, so. <laughs> the board's focus at this stage right now, we're asking you to focus on expenses because there's so many unknowns in the other realms. This is a slide that we shared with you uh, at the budget training. It's a complex slide, so I'm going to let it sit for a minute and talk to you about it. It talks about what Act 127 actually does to our equalized pupils based on the FY24 equalized pupil number, which was 1,376.82. Uh, it creates a new pupil number of 2,184.51. And we know from years of seeing our enrollment decline that that can impact the tax rate pretty significantly. What it did when we took it and applied it to the FY24 ed spending number is it brought our equalized per pupil spending from $23,022 down to $14,510. Just thinking, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Are both of those weighted numbers Yes. They're both used? No, yeah, are, are they both used simultaneously or are we moving from equalized pupils to the long-term weighted? We're okay. moving from equalized pupils to long-term weighted average okay. daily membership. And um, the 10% the It's a little different. Explain? It's a little different. Uh oh, I just went. <laughs> I advanced on my slide. <laughs> All right, there we go. All right, let me talk a little more about long-term weighted average daily membership. Uh, it's the two-year average of long-term average daily membership plus state place students plus all applicable weights. And the weights of the students are the, the big thing that really changed and then also categories. So grade level uh, has been involved in equalized pupils. Poverty has been involved in equalized pupils. New is sparsity or population density, which was a huge impact on our district. Um, this girl down there without doing that. Districts with small schools, uh, two-year average enrollment of a small school, which we used to get a small schools grant. You'll see in this budget that the small schools grant goes away with this legislation which negatively impacted us because we used to get $171,000, but it impacts us positively in this uh, weighting. And then also English language learners, so an ELL count. And I would just add 
the purpose of this is a recognition that different students cost different amounts of money to educate and we have been not really measuring that properly in Vermont for a long time and now we are and so it's it's designed to give um, the ability of communities who have a lot of these students to have um, a higher a higher amount of um, tax base to be able to to direct towards students. So. That's all right. Um, what the upshot is, the final upshot on the tax rate, if we applied this information to last year's spending, last year's um, <clears throat> information on the property yield, we would have had a tax rate of 94 cents instead of $1.49. So it's a sizable reduction applied to last year's numbers. Again, we don't know several things, so there's still a lot of flux. Uh, if the district increases, increases the spending per pupil over that number, that $14,510, then we're subject to a tax rate review by a committee. There's a lot unknown about what that committee looks like and what that review will look like, but that's what the legislature says, or the legislative action says. So if we increase that per pupil amount over 14,510, more than 10%, we end up in that review state. We're all continuing to learn more about this legislat uh, legislation. I know that Ursula and Floor and maybe some of you went to a training just this week. Um, there's more information coming out daily, more uh, requests for information from us that, that is going to impact the letter that comes from the tax commissioner on December 1st. So they're collecting ADM information, um, what we're estimating for possible budget increases across the state. Uh, and I will tell you that currently what we're being told is the early uh, estimates are coming in at about 12.8% across the state. So we're not outside of that realm. Um, this budget draft includes adjustments for estimated salary and benefit increases. Uh, health insurance is, came in at 16.4% increase, which the early estimate that I gave you was a 15% increase, so that went up. Uh, this draft also has movement of staff from columns, steps, uh, new hires that were brought in from last year to this year. So the early estimate was more around last year's staff. Uh, now we've got this year's staff. We've got information about that. It's a little bit tighter, a little bit firmer. And that's why the budget that you see in this packet, even though we made those sizable cuts, really didn't make an impact on the, the ed spending number. Came in almost the same, a 12.96% increase versus a 12.89, what we were projecting. Uh, in October. So, let's see if I got it. The expenditures you can see here, they're the amount the district plans to spend. Revenues are the money that the district anticipates receiving to offset those expenditures. Expenditures are going up, revenues are going down, the local ed spending goes up. We're anticipating an increase of $4.1 million, which is a 12.96% increase. Uh, page 19 in the packet that we sent out today, which was page 20 from Monday's packet, sorry about that, there was a blank page that we decided to take out at the last minute, uh, is a comparative budget summary that gives you a breakdown of the major changes in the budget from last year's final approved budget. And to provide you some perspective, a 1% increase in the local ed spending is equal to $316,972. Say that again, please. 316,972. So to round out our talking, so we stop and you can ask questions, we realize that that number of 12.96 is still very high, and that's with almost $900,000 in reductions. So we know, or we had conversation about where else we would um, consider reductions because in the 
you know, feedback around last year's budget process is the board wanting to know what it would impact if, if you were to ask us to reduce further. Um, we would consider further preschool restructuring to run fewer programs. We believe we could do this with some work and, and maintain robust programs with more consistent and full day. So this one for us is possible. That said, going from five to four, which is what we are actually proposing in this budget, we could consider talking about bringing that down to three. Um, Sometimes something like that, though, is a big enough move that you may prefer to do that in the context of configuration, but we want you to know that that's a conversation. Um, we could decrease Allied Arts, FTE, across you know, Music, Art, PE, um, to respond to our enrollment decline. This would maintain the same level of service to students. Um, this, however, would be small reductions over a large number of people. So there would be a lot of staff impacted. The total amount is, uh, when you pull it together, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it's not nothing, but it does impact a lot of employees. And I think the board needs to think about whether or not they want to do that, um, because it, we want to retain good staff. We want to take care of our people. Um, but it is true, we serve fewer students, um, and this would be responding to that and maintaining student services. We could look really closely at our intervention models. Um, we don't recommend doing this in a year because this would represent pretty large scale change, especially here at U32. Um, these are the types of things that we have talked about. The message that I think that we want to convey is Again, it's expensive to run our current configuration, and I say that without, um, without a judgment. It just is. And if there is a need to reduce further, in our current configuration, it would, with the exception of, of these first two, it would impact um, student services. And that second bullet would impact a large number of staff. Mm -hmm. you intervention models? So right now, um, we could use several examples of this. Um, we, we run intervention classes at the high school. They're very small by design. Um, if we were to look at that and revisit that model to be able to pull FTE out, we could look at that. But that's a pretty large scale change. But that's what that means is how do we deliver intervention services? We can look closely at that. <clears throat> um, again, on the intervention, can I get an example just so I understand what those types of classes are? Just, I'm curious, but then my other question was, should I let Steven answer and then I'll ask the second part? I don't know, unless it's related. I, will, I, I wasn't no, gonna look to Steven to answer that piece. He was looking attentive. All right, I figured it would be me. So, uh, so the current structure for interventions um, really does put a lot of teachers, so about 3.8 FTEs are used for high school intervention in the way that we have it configured. We could look at redoing some of our class sizes throughout the high school so that, and, and eliminating some classes so that we could reduce the total number of teachers necessary for, um, for all of those programs. So. If we said that our class sizes needed in all classes except for intervention needed to be 20 or greater, then and any class that was under 10 would be um, would, we would not run. Then we could reduce our FTEs to be able to meet some of those intervention services as well as you know trying to to bolster the class sizes as well. So I guess my follow up to that is because you mentioned it's a big change, yeah. and now I hear it's a very big change. Yes. <laughs> what do you have an idea? the scale of <coughs> relative reductions? Well, it wouldn't be all of that 3.8. Like, yeah. Well, so I would say that you're probably in the 2.5 to 3.5 FTE range, somewhere in that range of positions, just off the service, right? I mean, if we wanted to go deeper, we could, but that would be more programmatic changes at that point in time. Okay. And a, a simple math exercise, we still kind of use the estimate. It's about $100,000 with salary and benefits. It's probably more than that, quite frankly. Um, 
so you're talking, but I can't do math and when it's not round numbers. So two and a half is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, for FTE is hundred thousand for FTE. E yes, that's a very rough, gross. Rough. Yeah, exactly. Gross meaning rough. Yes. yes. Yeah. Daniel, and Daniel. Could we go back to the um, slide with the FTE losses per school? Um, I had a couple questions. One was um, what these represent in terms of a from where to where in terms of the FDEs and maybe a different way of asking the same question. How many specific individuals does that look like it's affected and are any of these um, counselor or nurse positions being zeroed out? No, I, we, I can have principals speak to what's left in their building. Um, EMS, folks who's on the slide here. Actually, I can do it. So Berlin would maintain a school counselor, a 1.0, they have two. One is funded by ESSER. They would be reducing one and have and adding this other position. East Montpelier, that's an enrollment-related um, position. Kat, you want to speak to Callis? And Callis would drop to a point four school counselor position. And a point six nurse. And a point six nurse. And a point six nurse. Yeah, sorry. Point six or point. It's a reduction of a point four. So it would go to point six. It would go no, to point six. Sorry, just to make sure it's really clear what um, is on this slide. We're talking about dropping of 1.0 FTE mm -hmm. currently for library media to a point six. Um, and what I'm not sure that um, everyone understands is right. We talked about this change last year, mm -hmm. and um, the person that we hired this year is duly endorsed so right now he is he's largely already doing this um, position of a roughly 0.6 uh, library media um, and the other part of his day he is spending um, as our fourth grade math and um, literacy teacher which helps offset the um, uh, and support uh, a more robust instruction for our very large 3-4 class of 26 students Given that explanation, can we get a sense on, in terms of the introduction, how many other uh, staff members potentially were being reduced, also wear multiple hats, so they have a broader impact than just um, a library media specialist? Sounds like math, you could say literary, literary, math literacy. Math literacy. literacy. Yes. You know, so are there any other uh, individuals that would be affected here that it's had a broader effect than just the singular? Um, um, role yep. here. Well, the first thing I would say in answer to that question is that it's hard to answer that question sometimes because seniority eventually factors in here. If someone who has a 1.0 and is being reduced to a partial FTE but they have been in the district longer, <coughs> that's not the person who would be reduced. And so there is potential for shuffling. Mm -hmm. We won't know that for, for quite a while. I don't know if there's any really concrete examples like yours, Kat, that anyone else can. Um, it, it, that's a hard question to answer. And not because, because we don't know the answer yet. Could we, could we just come back and finish the lists? Yes. Looking Sorry. at Doty, so it's a 1 to a 0.5 for the mm -hmm. school nurse? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, and there's, there's some health complications in there. She also delivered part of our health curriculum. And so it would be a reduction from a 1.0 school counselor to pre-COVID 0.8 school counselor. And then Romney's looks different. Romney does not have an ESSER funded counselor or nurse. So that's why you don't see those on the Romney side. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <coughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Funded. Thank you. So, <coughs> given the total, this was a suggestion to keep our points <coughs> school counselor. So, I just want to make be fair to the public because I don't want to. Like people oh, right. So uh, I want this part to be public input. Sorry. And so, and then board members will have a chance to ask questions too. And oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Suzanne. 
to get back to Diane's question, how is that 10% increase on per pupil spending being calculated if we're shifting between apples and oranges? Uh, it's the local edu education spending, so that bottom line, divided by the number of long-term weighted average daily membership. So <coughs> when we get that number of students, we'll divide that bottom line, and that's that per pupil number. If that goes above 14,510, that's our 10% calculation. Yeah, 14, so so they're going to use those weights yeah. for the past two years. The, yeah, so okay. that number, that's how they and developed then, a base, was telling okay, us. So we have, okay, so we have that number. Down. Yeah, we have the base, okay. that $14,000 number that was on the slide. 14,510. And, and <laughs> but even reducing that, keeping that below 10%, which is a reduction of 919,000, from the level service, from the level service budget, yeah, right, yeah, okay, it still means like a three and a half million dollar increase or whatever that was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and my my second question, and I think Chris asked this uh, the last time we were in conversations like this, and I don't want to don't want the question to be misconstrued. I've worked with so many members of the administration. I have so much deep respect, but all of the reductions that we're talking about are instructional. Did we look at any reductions in administrative staff? Yes, I can speak to that. So a couple things. This is really, for me, related to our current structure. I believe that if you're going to run a school, you need a principal to run it. Um, and yes, there is variability in the total number of folks. Um, we have principals here that teach classes. Um, so there is, you know, I think Zach in the past has talked about sort of like critical positions that exist regardless. Um, and then we have shared in the past our central office numbers are uh, quite thin comparably. Um, we can bring back more information on that if the board would like it in December. Um, but yeah, it's but, the right question. Yeah, yep. I think it just needed to be asked. Yep. Can I, okay. quick, quick so, clarifying. Yep. The 890,000 spending decrease is all, that all due to staffing reduction? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I know that we'll have a chance or whatever, but I want, I do wonder about, and it's a question way back to what Stephen was talking about in terms of if we look to reduce, uh, you know, that number 10 or making sure that it, all classes are 20 and up, that would be an equitably applied number, correct? So that would be all classes, including those that might be, I mean, what would that potentially look like for AP? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So whether or not we're able to apply that equitably, not just to intervention and, and that, but all across the board. Is that a... That's what the board wanted to pursue. We bring a full report on what classes would be affected. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna open it up for the public to either do public comment or ask questions related to the, to the presentation and that would inform the board's deliberations on their forward operations. So this is your time. Okay. Also opening it up, but maybe stop the share for a minute, if Mark, so I can see the screen, because I don't have it on my screen today. And to see if we have any hands up. I know that we have one hand up on the screen. Any, any members of the public, this is your time to ask, and then we'll have another opportunity at the end of the meeting. Go ahead, please say your name and where, which is your sure. Um Deborah Bloom, and I have two kiddos at Dobie. Um, I have a, a, a question that I'm not sure can be answered right now, but I would certainly be curious about. SR going away isn't new. We didn't just learn that when we started working on this year's budget. We knew it was a temporary patch. So, and you know, I'm glad to hear that Project Serve has been come to fruition and that is something that you're utilizing. But my question is in general, a year ago, I'm a little disappointed that there wasn't a larger conversation about other funding sources that exist out there to make up for some of these positions or some, because there, I know there, there are few, but they are out there. And so I'm wondering if you can speak at all to any research or any other funding positions that or funding sources that you're thinking about for filling some of these really critical roles in our small schools. I mean, we had this conversation about the nurses last year, 
and how long it takes EMS to get out to Worcester or up to Romney or to Callis. And the, that service, that person at the school is critical for the health and safety of our students in these rural areas. So that's, I, I don't know if anybody can answer that question right now or maybe I can come back, but what's the research being done for other funding sources for some of these positions? Well, one way I would answer that question is your administrators are recommending a level of staffing they believe meets student needs. And therefore, if they were concerned that it wasn't going to, then there would have either been seeking of other funding sources or, quite frankly, a different decision made um, at the building level. Um, again, these are reductions that they believe preserve student programming and exist in our current structure. And there are pathways to um, being able to resource our schools differently in different configurations. And it's not the programming piece, it really is the health and safety of the course. Thank you. Okay, we have two people online. So, Honey, and then. Thank you. Can you hear us? Hi there. Can you hear us? Yeah, there you are. Super. Hi. Um, I am Honeybean Barrett, and I teach at Doty, and I'm also a parent in the district. And I had two questions for you. One, are you willing to put forth an itemized savings um, it, from these proposed budget cuts? And two, are you thinking of providing transportation for the pre-K and kindergarten students that would be going to a school that's not um, in their town? And does that then still have, do we still have a savings there? Yes, we can put, uh, not not right this evening, but yes, that total, the total of the reductions is 890. We can, uh, in the next board packet, we can put out information about what that is for each. Um, and then yes, we would continue to provide transportation. Um, it is not our belief that that would uh, significantly increase costs on that side, and we would still provide it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you hon. Ian, I would just add that those cuts were not necessarily, you know, budget focused cuts. Correct. Correct. Yes. Can Lisa? you repeat that? Mm -hmm. What did you say? Those cuts were more focused on the size of those classes and to make them healthier sized classes than it was about budget cuts. Which is why it wasn't in that calculation of the 800 and whatever. I think they were. Yeah, they were. But um, I think they were. so they, they do result in cuts. But it's just it's the best yeah. evidence. Yeah, the focus was there. there but yeah. Lisa, go ahead. Hi, I'm Lisa Hanna. I'm a Worcester resident. Um, I taught at Doty for 10 years and now I'm still teaching uh, in Lamoille South. Um, I guess my question is more of a hypothetical or just a proposal of a way of framing or thinking about this. Um, but in my time in education, especially in the last couple of years, I, I will be honest to say that I haven't met another um, person in education, administrator, teacher who who feels like we have enough robust supports for students, despite everyone's best efforts. It's been a challenging number of years. And so now as we as we look at this challenge that we have to face with our budget and we see teacher cuts and nurse cuts and counselor cuts, and we still use the language of, you know, we're going to provide robust support for students. I just wonder, and I ask everyone if there's any value in speaking more frankly about this and admitting a little bit more frankly that um, that maybe because due to budgetary concerns, we may need to provide less robust supports. Um, it's, it's not what I want, but I also, it feels a little bit like we're not um, digging into the realities of what we have to face. And I think there's value for the community and for the board um, to talk about that more frankly. Um, because again, as an educator, I, 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 we, ha we haven't had a lot of conversations where we feel like we're having, we have everything we need, even if we highly, highly value <laughs> what everyone is trying to do. And so it's hard to look at cuts and still um, feel like there is true honesty and transparency in that statement um, that we'll be able to provide those robust supports. Thank you. Anybody else in the public that has anything to add? Okay. So we're gonna we're not gonna move right into that part uh, for members, but we're gonna move into 
and I'm gonna make sure to give you guys a little bit of a break too because we've been sitting for a little while so maybe what I'll do before we dive in is just have five minutes to use the bathroom and grab some food because I know a lot of you were not able to grab your food. There's an echo. Yeah. Okay. That's not the best way to send this to you. Uh, sorry, guys. Yeah. I just sent it to you, Mark. Oh. So I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. The thing is that it won't let me send it. Maybe we'll move into I think, well, I think you can just uh, okay. mute your microphone and speak. I, I did, but then it doesn't play the sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I sent it to you, but I have to text it because it's too big to email it. <laughs> you won't be able to get it on this. Is it a uh, Google Doc? No. No. OK, I'm going to wait to resolve that one. You I mean, may not be able to show it that way. Oh. No, I think, Mark, we'll just move on. Yeah, let's move on. What, 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 I, could, what I could do is just, we can see your email. We have our entire schedule. Can you guys see it? Oops. Oops. That was perfect. Yeah, I, you won't be able to see them, but you would just hear the report. Since they made it, I feel kind of guilty not presenting it to you. Hi, board members. Sorry we can't make today, but we have our entire schedule ready and we're going to go through it right now. So I'm going to talk about word of mouth. Word of mouth is next Tuesday and we get to perform original piece of music and we have a ton of signups this week so it's super exciting and we can't wait to do it. There's always a bunch of student interaction. We always go and watch and we always uh, cheer everybody on and it's yeah. Next thing we're going to talk about is the sports banquet. So that is kind of just a celebration of um, just like a celebration of all the um, fall sports in this case. Um, just like celebrating our achievements, having the fun, and it was really fun. Everybody got great awards. Yeah. Our two principals awards went to Warren McLean and Willow Long, so congrats to both of them. And the best part in the sports banquet is everyone brought in items for the food bank. So I scheduled a food drive. I scheduled a food drive and I'll send you a photo and there were so many items of food and it was great and I'm so happy everyone contributed. It's great. I'm going to send it all tomorrow. And we're going to feed some people for Thanksgiving. It's going to be great. <laughs> then, the um, next thing we're going to talk about is the sex ed course that has been set up and is happening after school, Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, this program is run by Alice Lane and Mosaic. Ooh, she's our <laughs> filmer right now. <laughs> she's on the book of walking the wall. Thank you. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, it's really great. Just talking about like sexual education and like how you can have safe sex on two and just learn more about yourself and other people and I think it'd be great. Anyway, that's after school on Monday and Wednesdays. A reminder, also something that's going to be happening for us is we're going to meet with SSJ, which is Seeking Social Justice at 110. I invite any of the board members to come next Monday. I invite any board members to come and take charge of learning more about your students and what they're doing. Um, last thing we want to do is invite some of the, well, all of the board members to come to the next meeting for questions with them on our about the student body and like just what has been happening and stuff and personally want to help. And just really I think you're curious because that's why we're here and we're welcome welcoming these questions. We're interested to see what you guys think and what you guys are truly curious about throughout our school that as much as you guys are part of our board. It's good to bring in that community-based stuff into our school and get it through. So we invite you guys, and we hope the meeting goes well. See ya. Okay. What, what was the 
thing that she was inviting us to. I didn't hear. It didn't say date. It just said invite. We'll follow up. We'll follow okay. up. Yes. Okay. So thank you. It didn't say date. Okay. Thank you, Will and Lena, for sending the report. I'm sorry we couldn't broadcast it, but hopefully everybody was able to hear it. Uh, superintendent in Central Office and Leadership Report. It was in your packet. And I'm wondering if there's any questions, just because I know that this, most of our time is going to be consumed on budget or any highlights. If there's no questions, I had a couple of questions to maybe highlight a couple of things. Is that okay? Yeah, so I was, Stephen, I was wondering if you could share a little bit more and, uh, about a bar week. I could share a little bit. Yeah, I, I went into the website, but it was just one page, and it's just like, do you mind just sharing? It's exciting so the community yeah, can so know about for, it. Uh, for the last three years, um, one of our school counselors, um, Jade, and um, has been leading a group of teachers um, around Barwe, which is building anti-racist white educators. Um, and so that group, but if you saw the, I did a link in there to the group that started this, which was in Philadelphia, in that area. And, um, and that group meets uh, monthly um, to discuss issues of, associated with essentially being white teachers um, who would teach students of color. And so um, they discuss some of the issues that come up. There's um, usually a curriculum piece that comes out of Barwe itself. So they actually have uh, publications um, that, that talk about, okay, here's an article to read and have a discussion about that. And so that's generally the format that they follow. Um, during that time. Uh, it, it varies in its membership in terms of numbers, but I would say that on average we have about 20 to 25 teachers who attend uh, the meetings. And so it's a, it's a pretty good group. Thank you. Is that the, is that the information you wanted? Yes, yes. Okay. Just to let people out, uh, I'm aware of the community members from that to, to, to hear in, I could, I could keep going, but I don't want to put everybody on on the spot. But I was wondering, because of the conversation that we're having, I'm wondering, Alicia, if you don't mind sharing your little piece in academic achievement, mostly about the data for how you identify areas of growth and that have implication on your tier one instruction. Is that guy? You can ask anything you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're asking about teacher goal setting, looking at data. In the, yes. the, yeah, we've been doing this for quite a few years and looking at, we teachers do goal setting several times throughout the year and looking at those benchmark assessment windows, one of them just happening this fall. And thinking about, because we have such an emphasis right now on our layers one and two, which is classroom instruction and, and classroom teachers really using the data that they have to identify needs and address those needs and set academic goals for their students. Like if a you know if a student doesn't understand this concept, the the hope or the goal is that they will have it by this time and right taking some data on that and um, so looking at a whole class and setting goals for their students and instructional goals for themselves, and then coming back and talking about those and measuring them. We'll come back to that in the winter when we look at the next benchmark um, assessments to say how did we do, how did, you know, did, those, did what we were doing work, and if not, why not, and what will we do about it? Is that helpful? Yeah. I, I think we just do two because I would love to hear from, from everybody, but because of time, Unless board members have any other questions, I was just I'll just repeated appreciation for the detail of it. Yeah, it's it's really really helpful to hear all of the good things that are happening at school. Uh, the next uh, part is the Central Vermont Career uh, Career Center. I just wanted to highlight actually have here highlight a couple of, of things. Is that tomorrow uh, Thursday is the open is the open day at, from five thirty to seven thirty. And uh, it's a great day to visit the Career Center. It's an open house, and you get to see all the different programs, meet the teachers, meet the students, and it's a great way for board members. And what was the date? Tomorrow, November 16th. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 5:30 to 7:30 p.m. And then the the other thing is that we had the opportunity to uh, have a highlight with the governor. Came to the center, and they were able to visit and. Uh, 
and mainly the, uh, around the state, there's a lot of uh, advocacy going on right now in support of career and technical education. And, uh, you know, Superintendents Association, Vermont Scooters Association, and both uh, uh, Jody and Scott Farr have been really uh, good about providing data to make sure that we're able to fund our career centers in a better way. And those were the only two highlights there. Uh, for the next one is the Vermont School Birth Association uh, report. If you didn't go to the webinar, uh, make sure to look at the ba at the ba at the database of webinars, and there's a great explanation of exactly the questions that we're talking about today on Act 127 and on budgeting. That's a great resource for you guys to have. Uh, we send the students uh, a webinar that is uh, not a webinar, an invitation. There's going to be an open group of students across the state to see how they can network and, and figure out better ways to serve as board members. And last on December 12th, there's going to be a, a webinar at, from 6 to 7 p.m. for people to be able to come in, anybody that is interested in serving in a board member, so if you can spread the word, that would be great. We have invited a few people to to participate and encourage others. I'm looking at one. I'm not going to be able to be there, but I'm hoping others are going to be able to be there. Uh, education quality update, Ursula. So I'm reporting back on what we talked about at our November 1st education quality meeting, and we reviewed the fall iReady math and a meeting assessment data, and it does not get reported out to the full board <coughs> as a report, but we see it, as Alicia mentioned, as our growth data that we look at when we look at the weekly assessment. We also got to the staff and administration use the assessment data that she talked about, but we got to hear some of the feedback of how they were um, doing that information, and so that was really nice. We were scheduled to discuss education quality standards, which we've heard several times in budgeting and during reconfiguration conversations. Um, ed quality is going to take a deep dive into those ed quality standards. We were supposed to do it in November per our working calendar, but it is a working calendar and didn't feel we had the time to give it justice, so we're moving it to our December meeting. And what we did was review them very briefly. I asked people to skim the like 14 page document, it's beautiful reading. Um, so that we could bring questions to Jen, so that she can include them in her presentation so that we can get the education that we need. And it's so that we can also own information on those ed quality standards when questions arise while we're talking about budget reconfiguration. Great. Okay. Any questions or we're going to move into the finance part? Okay. So the Finance Committee uh, part, we're all the way in six now. Uh, 6.1 is configuration study report out. The committee met, met today uh, at 4.30. And we've been doing this practice of having three bullets to report back to you. Uh, so the committee brainstorm ideas for possible uh, configuration today. Uh, we, uh, we agree on three areas to explore, but we, uh, uh, we, and, and we also discuss uh, what kind of information would be helpful in order to discuss those ideas. And last, uh, we want the board to go through the same activity, and we're talking about making that possible on our December 6th uh, meeting for the board. That's what we have to report from that group today, but it was a great exercise. Um, okay, I'm gonna count on the finance committee members, uh, alias. Kari and Ursula and Daniel, and I'm looking for a motion. It's on page 13 or on your finance packet to review the, the, and approve the brick qualification criteria for 2024 capital improvement projects. Daniel. I move that the board establish the recommended pre qualification criteria that contractors must meet to be included on a selected list of pre qualified bidders for the 2024 combined capital projects. Thank you, Daniel. Second. Second by Ursula. Discussion. Any questions? Any clarifications? Yes. Yeah, yes. Um, how um, would these criteria be proven? I mean, what type of criteria would you say a contractor would have to show in order to prove that they meet your criteria? Um, and is it an 
like does it have to meet all 21 criteria or is there a weighting of of um, priority uh, no, these are the, the criteria that we would request of all of our bidders. Okay. And so they'd go through a, a pre-qualification process. They'd yep. submit proof of each of these items. And Bill and Chris and John Hemmelgarn from Black River Design would review the applicants and decide who is qualified to move forward to the bidding stage. Okay. And, and so you just answer my other questions. Who would be checking that? <laughs> Thank you. Any any other questions? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you, Jonathan. Any abstentions? All right. Motion carries. Okay. okay. Review and approve the scope and budget for the Berlin Fire Alarm. Fire Alarm. I'm looking for a motion again. Ursula, your hand is up. I move that the board authorize an additional allocation of $13,894 from the Capital Reserve Fund for the replacement of the Berlin Fire Alarm Panel to be completed in fiscal year 2024-2025 and approve the district moving forward with the bid document development and bidding as necessary. Second. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you, Daniel. Discussion, any questions? I have. Yeah, go ahead. I, was, I, I noticed it's to include the contingency, and I was curious what the contingency percentage is. Is that 10%? 10%. And yeah. that's dictated by us or by them? Um, it's one that we use, but they did propose it with 10%. Okay. So both, I guess. We, we usually use 10%. And how often are we seeing those go include the contingency and expense? The uh, from the, from the, bid, or the quotes? Yeah. Maybe 50-50, like yeah. some of them will and some of them won't. And it's up to us whether we, you know, <coughs> use that as the contingency or not, but it just happened to be the same. Thanks. Any other questions? Mm. Okay. okay. Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Okay, uh, we're going to discuss during board operations 6.4, so don't be scared. We're getting there. Uh, discuss budget parameter uh, number five. We actually have uh, this before. Uh, the finance committee uh, met and keep one and send sort of half and half. That way, <coughs> uh, like Megan and uh, as Suzanne mentioned, and, this, and our leadership team mentioned, that parameter was, we kept saying a soft parameter, soft parameter. So at the end of this, I know the first part will seem familiar, but at the end in red, we have proposed two parameters to change. So we would eliminate parameter number five, the one that talked about bring the net impact of the expenses budget under the October inflation rate. And the proposal would be to have this two parameters, consider configuration changes that realizes program quality improvements, improvements that can serve more students. And the other one, lowest increasing net spending with meeting a EQS and addressing equitable distribution of resources and student needs. And so in the, we can talk to it one, sorry, my here <laughs> In the, in the first one, what, what we were hoping by this parameter is that it, allow us, it allows us to look at configuration. This might be a little easier to have this conversation after we debrief the budget in some ways, but this is where we had it on the agenda. I don't know if there's anybody that has concerns with that one, but in essence is to allow them to be creative to achieve education equity and taking into consideration the experience and opportunity and outcomes in some ways, right? But bringing that keyword of configuration allows them to, to do that work. Floor, floor. Is, is this in addition to the previous. The, the, the previous? We will take out number five completely. And they bring the net impact to expense budget under the inflation rate. And, oh, that's true. And we will take out uh, number six. I have a question. So yeah. I would also suggest that instead of number four, mm -hmm. but which I don't 
you know, big, there isn't the threshold for the penalty, but there is the threshold for the tax rate review. It was yes. my understanding that that was the parameter that we yes. approved rather uh, than. Yeah, and we had already. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll update that one. Floor. Yes. I think the, the, so the last one, the lowest increase in that spending, that's meant to replace both five and seven. Like combined. With those other members. So, are we discussing these at this point? Yes. Okay. So, um, so to clarify, Jonas, what you just said about number four. The number four. Right. Oh, oh, number four. four. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 No. 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 Right here. Making number four. The parameter. Four. Number four. Parameter four. Parameter four is not actually what we discussed. It was the the ten percent mm -hmm. increase over the fourteen thousand five hundred and right. So tenant water. Yes. Water if it helps, the way we phrased that in the slide was option four: avoid the tax rate review. That's right. Yes. Blah blah blah. Yeah. So I guess I guess so. Yes, that is a parameter, but I can, as a board member, knowing that this is really new ground in Vermont and that we're hearing of its impact across the state with many, that I think as a board member we need to understand that too. And yes, we are working to avoid it, but I, for me, I, I just want to be clear that that might be a parameter, but if we're finding that that gets pushed against, then I think we need to use. I, I, I agree, and I think that the tenor of the conversation we had last time was not that this is a red line, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And yeah. we used the experience of last year when mm -hmm. Megan and the administration came back to us and said, we can't meet your parameter mm -hmm. the, the, the yeah. quality, at quality standards, right? And we appreciated that, right? So the, the, the parameters are not red lines. Yes. They are what the board would like to see. Okay. But that's, that's my that's understanding. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. Then go a, ahead. A, a question that I have with that one, but we do agree that we want to avoid the tax review, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, okay. but, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> Just to be clear. No, yeah, no, but I'm we're not going to rain down fire and brimstone if that doesn't come to pass, right? Lisa, that in the business that I know. Hold on one minute. Yeah. No, I'm, who was first? I just, Daniel, go. Oh, I had two things. One was, um, we, I, I don't want to, I don't want to have a tax rate review. But we also, we also were talking about how much emphasis we're placing on what we can control versus what we cannot control, and so to include a parameter that, that is framed around tax rates seems. To fly a little bit in the face of that, I guess, for me. Um, and the other thing I was going to say was um, it feels to me, I mean, I'm all for um, removing the old five. The old five one. I, I it, you know, given that the proposed personnel reductions. Represented eight hundred and ninety thousand in savings. I had my back of the envelope math. I think it, where we would be looking around three million dollars in cuts to hit that, and that, that's. I guess I'm not an expert. It seems as if we would have a lot of trouble meeting ed, ed quality standards. Unless we even, consider even remotely, unless w without drastic, you know, configuration changes. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm all for removing. So just to finish okay. number four, just just to because you have said yeah, so will will we remain under the Act 127 for people spending to avoid the tax? That's that, that, that's right. And and Daniel, I, I I totally hear. I think it's important for us to have at least one parameter here that's based on a number, <laughs> right? There's a lot in here about equity, right, and doing the best we can and configuration. But I think that you know. I, I, I would I would imagine that Suzanne and her team appreciate at least having you know a, 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 some kind of target, right? No, I think that's important also. And while it affects the tax rate, meaning we would be sent for tax rate review, it is a number we can control because it is based on our local education spending and our per pupil number that we will eventually know. Thank you. Just Chris. a background question for Suzanne. The 
12.9% budget increase. Is that based on the new weighting system? So that we're already over the 12, 10%? Or is it based on the old system? So that 12.9 is just on the local education spending budget number. Mm -hmm. It has not factored, factored in any equalized pupil yet. Okay. When we know the new long-term weighted average daily membership, mm -hmm. we will take that number and apply it to the total uh, local education spending number. So we'll take the local education, divide it by the equalized pupil number, the new equalized pupil number. Okay, so are we flying very blind here in terms of uh, trying to get to <laughs> a number that's less than the 10% review triggers? Or are they're, we, they're really we separate earlier, though. They're pretty comfortably under that with what we were talking about. I would about. say we're not comfortably under it. I think we're comfortably over it. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, over yeah, 10%. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. Okay. yes, because if you take our current budget, which is over 10%, already, yeah. and you apply the same exact number of pupils, you're going to be over it. But aren't they increasing the number of, student, of pupils increasing but, uh, with the new formula? From, so what they did was they gave us the long-term weighted average daily membership of what it would have been applied to last year's student numbers. Oh, but and that 10% number. is a, a, an increase over that base amount that they came up with. Okay. So we know what our base is, and if it goes over that, and chances, we don't know everything. We don't know how our students will be weighted at the end of the day, but we do know enrollment decreased. So we already know there's one factor in our long-term weighted average daily membership that word is so long <laughs> that it's already decreasing it, which is going to increase our per pupil. So we already know one factor that's going to cause it to go up. We also know that the budget is a factor that's going to cause it to go up. So we've got a couple factors that are indicating going above 10%. Because of the fact that we now have to take whatever would have been covered by ESSER, and if we're continuing it forward, that is going to automatically create this increase in our ed spending, potentially, depending on what we're doing there. So there's a number of factors that are playing against us. So going back to just, so for check, okay, with yeah. that change of language before, number five, can we change number five to that first red bullet that you have there? So, uh, is it the first one or the second one? The first one. Because their comparison is a realized program of quality improvement that serve more students. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you're right. It's the last one. Yeah. Okay, so Number we're five is that. the last one. Because I, I have a question here. about the first one. So number seven, we replace number five, which is the one that... We're replacing five and seven, per yeah. Kari's comment. It sounds like we're replacing five and seven with the second read proposed language. It says lowest understood. increase that one? Yep. Yeah, okay. yep. lowest increase in net spending with meeting the EQS and addressing equitable distribution of resources and student needs, which essentially combines the two and comes up the language. Mm -hmm. I'm good with it. And we're replacing yeah. number six yeah. with the first. Yeah, but we're not there. Yes. She so, to, yeah. She's going numerically through them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's yeah. not that's a five. Yeah. Yeah. Seven is after seven. six, or seven. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think, I, I, I think I the easiest way to do it is to just like, let's just give input in those two that are there. Yes. To figure out how to place them. So, yeah. So, because there could be racial changes, I realize this program quality improvements that can serve more students. You so, my clarification that. is that um, more. That, you know what I mean, that I don't know that we're necessarily only considering a configuration change that would serve more students. Because if I apply this thinking to one of the recommendations here, we're not serving any more students. We might be, we're changing up how we're serving the preschool and the kindergarten changes by that reconfiguration, but it doesn't necessarily mean we're serving more. I, I think there's a ratio missing there serving more students, right, per, per resource unit. There's something, but something it's like, like, like yeah. I just, I want to be sure that we're not giving the impression that we're somehow magically by changing I think this configuration. That can serve, I, would, I would suggest that can serve students more efficiently. That, I would, yeah. Like, we're not or, finding students. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 that was your idea. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah, and the, the, the idea of it, we went back and forth, back and forth in how to uh, work method, right? Because mm -hmm. if we just said more efficient, and then it doesn't say about the experience and the mm -hmm. outcomes. So we, we felt like more, you know, so we could add a... How about, how about better service students? Better yeah. service yeah. 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 There you better go. That can better. Don't ask me to find that. Okay. Both, what do you Okay. Okay. Okay, with that one. So then the low, the next one. Do you guys have a problem with that one? You change with to while meeting. While they can okay. respect that. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Question. Yes. What was substantive substantively different between the red line to consider configuration changes and number six, other than develop options changing to consider? Yeah. Why? I don't understand why we're rewriting that. Yeah, and it's just, to tell you the truth, both of these ones came from trying to get, take out number five. It didn't really come out of just trying to, but may this thing, present isn't this redundant, six and the new one? Mm. Like, well, we change. It just is the word configuration, configuration is, is, configuration. is different. Longer yeah. term configuration changes. <clears throat> Consider configuration changes, what is the, I don't, I'm not it's the results in improved student outcomes versus yeah, yeah why, better to serve students. What was yeah. wrong with results in improved uh -huh. student outcomes? Are we taking that? Is that going away? Mm -hmm. Or is this repli Is this know. in addition? It's in addition. <laughs> we were, okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's what I was. Oh, it's in addition. We're not. Yeah, I thought we were we, replacing. We were replacing so. number right. five and number seven with Thank number you. with this last. one. Is it possible to track the next time? I didn't think they were taking out. Yeah. <laughs> it was the, the, this two came out of trying to replace number five. And then and then as Carrie said, this makes sense. We need to budget the situations around equality standards, equitable distribution of resources. So if you are okay with approving this two, I'll bring this back to the finance committee and then just organize the parameters. On, on that, and clarify it to the board members. As long as you don't hate those two, we still don't understand why we need to duplicate that. It seems redundant. Develop options, consider. But you're asking for the same thing. I wonder if we just pause on this, because what this mm -hmm. is really asking is to give administration some direction. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if after the, the feedback on budget one, I presume you will give us direction that is either stay the course, mm -hmm. do this, do that, and that's sort of what the parameters are supposed to be, and maybe it will make more yeah. sense after that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we did. I find us. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I was just going to say, I would recommend in the future um, doing what the policy committee does and, and use the editing function yes. so yes. that we can see what's going to change. Just to simplify the discussion. In the okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. We just added two at the end to change number five. Yeah. That's a good idea. Okay. So let's move into the policy committee. Sorry, I was having a hard time following. So the outcome of that this whole discussion was that we're removing number five. And then she's going to go back to the finance committee. He's going to go back out. to the finance committee, and and just if you took the notes on better, okay, that can better serve students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and well, those that would be the only. Okay. Yeah, and then the finance committee will, okay. and then we're going to talk about it at the end of the budget discussion. Okay. Or, I have to ask them a sure, question. Caroline. I just thought I heard something that I want to see where the board is at. It sounded like. There was talk about us doing further work so that you avoided the tax review. And then there were comments that we wouldn't be held to that. And um, so I just wanted to clarify if that was what the board was asking you to do and then share a little perspective if that's okay. 
that that is absolutely the worst nightmare is that we are asked after we came back with a draft that had roughly 800,000 worth of cuts to be asked to go back and do $950,000 worth of cuts only to know that the whole board does not firmly agree that that is the expectation. That's a lot of work and conversation with people to then have it not feel good and go back. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened last year. Mm -hmm. Thank that you. Uh, yeah, I think we need to take that into consideration when we talk about mm -hmm. the budget. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, we're gonna move okay. into the policy committee work. Sure. Um, I think we had a pretty good meeting last time. Yeah. Like, a little over the two hours, which, which was kind of astounding. But, um, so we have a couple of uh, policies here for first read, including B20, which is personnel recruitment, selection, appointment, and background checks policy. Uh, what is significant about this is that it incorporates the recent change in the Vermont Supreme Court, uh, well, not Vermont, but the U.S. Supreme Court in terms of uh, affirmative action issues and it makes clear that we can consider diversity issues in recruitment, but we make very clear that it is we do not decide hiring based on diversity factors to stay on the right side of the law. And so that is very clear in the policy. I think the BSBA actually did a pretty good job differentiating between those two processes in the recruitment um, process. Uh, so that, that is our first. Any questions on D20? I noticed in um, <clears throat> the second page of this, this would be 30 of the packet, bullet two under recruitment. It does away with the requirement that the administration provide a report, which I support. I think that, that was really aspirational when we created that. I've seen that happen before where you ask for a report and then there's no system to follow up. Right. That was under my radar. I didn't even know we did that. But, yeah. What does the board want to report? What do you think not? We haven't missed it. No? <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't had time to mm -hmm. miss it. Okay. Um, the other thing that is notable is that we no longer have the criminal question about criminal history in the hiring, in the application process. We still ask in the hiring process, but not in the application, because that is illegal in Vermont now by statute. So the, the policy is amended because prior policy allowed for that. So we'll bring it back next time for a adoption. Okay. Uh, the next policy up is the, for first reading, is the B34 Library Media Center Selection and Reconsideration Policy, uh, and we did kind of a whole overhaul on it, um, using guidance from the Great School Partnership Policy, and what um, we really focused on was uh, putting a lot of faith in our uh, library professionals uh, to make selections for um, our libraries in conjunction with the, with the faculty, and staff members, uh, and rely a lot on their judgment and support them. Uh, the, we also incorporated the process for any challenges that anybody, not anybody, um, there's a certain group and it's community members, um, staff members, students, um, but basically have to, or a resident of our, of our school district, uh, if they want to challenge a, a book and there's a process for working through going to the librarian first, then the principal, superintendent, and ultimately the board. And the board is the one who makes the final decision on that. Um, and we had it with the board because if there's challenges, more likely than not, they're gonna be hot political potatoes. And uh, we thought that the board would be the one to make that decision and uh, deal with that. Uh, so, but we did limit who could make the complaint to uh, our community, essentially our community members and not, not an outside group, mm -hmm. unless community members sponsor them, of course, but. Mm -hmm. Megan, you're good with the board being the final yes. board? Yes. Yes. She said something like, thankfully. <laughs> 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 Chris. Yeah. 
I have a bunch of questions. <laughs> um, what? Is it like you ready? Grace? What? No, no, like no, uh, yes. He's doing a dance. They may or may not connect. <laughs> Um, VSBA has a selection of library material policy, D22. I'm curious why we're not using the same numbering. Um, Is it because it's drastically it different? Yeah, we did numbered. not even catch that their policy was yep. differently numbered. Our, and ironically, also in here is a reading of our own policy, which says we will align with VSBA yeah, yeah, yeah. numbering. Mm -hmm. Which made so me think of it. Policy so committee will we'll talk about that. So, so that number is there? D22. And it is worded slightly differently, which also made me wonder how, and I think it would have to be parsed out because I think it's intermixed. How much of this is policy versus procedure? So and whether some of it needs to be pulled out. Um, well, we intentionally kept it in um, just so that it was clear because it really deals with the objection part. Uh, so it was very clear what the procedure, and you're right, it is procedure, and we're very cognizant of that. But having the procedure right there so that everyone knew what the procedure would be and what the decision making chain would be. Um, but you're right, we, it's, it's unusual in, the, in that respect, and that has more procedure in the policy, embedded in the policy, and will become part of the policy than normal. And from an administration's perspective, this is one of the policies that I believe would benefit from that level of clarity in policy, in policy okay. which is unusual for that to be true. But this one benefits because it is tends to be such a very, uh, it's usually not a non-emotional yes. situation. So then in that, like I'll call it the review section, we have a timeline for when the request is brought up to the principal. They have 30 days from the moment of request. We do not have a time limit for when, like when the superintendent, like if it goes up to the next level to the superintendent, we don't give a time mm -hmm. for when they should respond. And then when it comes to us, the timeline is 45 days after the hearing, but there's no time frame given for the hearing. It's inconsistent. I don't know if there's just, I don't know if I'm missing something or if we're missing timelines that maybe should be in there. Um, I think number two, I would say. Um, we were pulling from the um, other policy mascot. that we had for oh, the mascot yeah. policy. So the 30 and days was based on principal recommendation of that felt reasonable to be able to pull this together. So our principal okay. reps helped with that. Uh, good catch. There is no timeline for me. We probably should be. <laughs> <laughs> and the 45 school days, to Chris's point, was um, to be consistent with the other policy that we have that request hearing, which is the mascot policy. Yeah. Okay. And basically gives flexibility. That's right. Yeah. Gives yeah. yeah. like the board Yeah, like for the scheduling of the hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff yeah. Because yeah. it doesn't yeah. just involve yes. us, it involves other people. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. it just gives you the ability to, to, to do that. And then, because Megan's report is, is in writing, it's supposed to complain in writing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the principal's is in writing too. I don't know, like whether we want to also say 30 days for Megan or I don't know. Policy committee. Whatever you feel about it. Yeah, send it back to them and think about it. There should be. So then, when I was looking at this, I also looked at the greater schools policy. Mm -hmm. And I noticed the whole to assist with the selection of material, which is on page 33. We took that straight from the greater schools policy, pretty much, but they also have another section that details very specific criteria for the selection um, that felt like it discussed more global implications of diversity and equity and those considerations. Um, and I was curious why we did one and not both. Uh, you know, I don't really discuss that. Yeah, I mean, I think the origin of where we landed might be an answer to that question, or might not. Two things. The, the reason for the first part in using the great schools, this is actually just a basic snapshot of the Library Bill of Rights. Our previous policy just referenced it. And from a strength of being really clear about what we believe, we thought this should say it. So we took that section specifically to say it's, it's a little bit of belief statement, whereas before it was a reference. And then from there, we largely kept the policy the same and then inserted our own procedures. So I don't know that it was by design that it didn't keep going. 
Great Schools Partnership is always a, also a very lengthy mm -hmm. policy. It is. So um, that's all. I don't know if that answers your question, but I, that's the origin of it. It's the one that caused me pause when, when we talked about representation of the many religious, ethnic, cultural groups and their contributions to our American heritage, whereas like the further list of criteria talks about global um, ethnic and cultural considerations. And we, as part of our mission, have a discussion of making global citizens. I don't know. It was a thing that Good questions for we'll the policy committee. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 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 In the review. Yeah. Thank you. Any others? Nope, that was it. Great. That was Thank my bunch. Those, six months. Thank you. Anyone else? No, we can move to A2 so that we can keep rolling. <laughs> okay. Next up is um, the second reading for transportation policy. What? Board of Directors. And that's a C3. Well, A2, 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 A2
I still feel that they're going to explicitly have a heading on review. We should we should assert our own right to review. So you could amend that to add the word review. Adopt, maintain, and review, perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Policy A. Under policy A, a yep. the school board a should adopt, a maintain, a and review policies. Yeah, it's A30 from the SPM. Yeah. Can you pull it and does okay. it say under review? Does it have something for oh, you? Oh, you can look at that. Which is what we Just asking. Although this is a model policy from the SPM. This is a. 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 Okay, I'm going to try to keep us going, Chris, I'm not trying to take it off from you, but we got to mobilize, so next. Next, okay. Thank you, Daniel. Um, next is 820. Let's go, is this okay? Yes. <laughs> I'm good. What number should be? <laughs> um, this is uh, board meetings agenda and preparation. And, and board meetings and agenda preparation. Any comments or questions on this? Next is 820. Uh, 822. 822. We're just doing 820. Oh, 822. I'm sorry. Um, notice of non-discrimination. Aligned it with the uh, BSPA. Any questions? Okay. Next up is our home study students policy, C6. No, 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 no. C3. 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 Sorry, transportation C3. So when second is second reading. reading. This is up for adoption. Yeah, so can we do those two on a slate since there's no changes and we read them the last time? Could we do both C3 and C6? Uh, looking for a motion from we'll the committee. We move that we adopt the proposed for, um, C3 and C6. Thank you, Kari. A second, but yeah. Any questions? Um, Okay. Any discussion? Any questions? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you, Policy yeah. Committee. That was great. And thank you for the memo. Okay. This is the big one. Feedback from the budget draft one. And questions. Um, thank you for the hard work that went into this. I have concerns specifically about Alice and Dodie having such drastic reductions in nursing and counseling, which I understand why that happened with the loss of ESSER funds, but um, particularly with nursing, we've talked before, like, I mean, it's kind of one of those things where you have one or you don't, not like on a given day, you might have a nurse in the building. Yeah. Um, so for safety, I have big concerns there. And then in terms of mental health, the nurse serving that big role and then with the loss of counseling, counseling, FTE also, I just worry about the social emotional component. And I'm wondering if it's those two schools that are losing, you know, having reductions in these areas, is this actually <coughs> equitable, which is one of our goals, and does it actually meet student needs? Um, so. Leave it there, Can I follow up on McKellen's question by asking pre COVID what were the nursing staffing levels in those schools? Mm -hmm. Yes. With that reconstruction. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. This was, these would be taking them back to the FTE that were in place previously um, pre COVID. Thank you. And I also want to um, just illustrate there is a balance between autonomy and equity and that is so that answer to equity it is that's what we did last year is we, we recommended across the board and we made a conscious decision not to do that so that each building could make that decision and 
the bumper of ed quality standards. So I'm, I'm not, I can't give you an answer to, part of that is comment, and that's for the board to discuss. I'm just trying to give you a. And I guess when I say equity, on. I think specifically of the um, higher level of need that, um, that may be true in some of these schools compared to others. Is that a measurable, like can we measure the amount of need that may be in one school over another? Well, that's our third lens. So I, I think what our message is to you is we believe this recommendation fits all three mem uh, lenses, which is quality, equity, resources, and um, student need. And so that's how we made the decision. Obviously, it is up to the board to give us direction, but that's where that came from. I guess I was just moved by um, Lydia Fazy, the nurse who, you know, is from East Montpelier and her children went through East Montpelier just being overwhelmed by the amount of need she's seen at Doty. And that's not measurable. Maybe she would have been overwhelmed if she was the nurse in one of the other schools as well. But um, anyway. You know what that, what that makes me really think about it. it's like, do we need to have a bigger sense of community for what Doty is? So it did, you know, would we better serve the needs of the students as the nursing by combining them, seeing that we're not needing, you know, just seeing where we are, that we're not really like scratching where we need where we need to be. When I hear that, I'm like, well, maybe if there's more need and the students need a nurse all the time, then maybe we need to have a change in configuration in order to best serve and use, you know, the nurses that we have right now. And that's Absolutely. what it brings to right. me, mm -hmm. you know, not necessarily bring back a full-time mm -hmm. nurse to to, is that the responsible thing? I agree. That's what it Absolutely. makes Absolutely. in the long term. term. Yeah, I agree with that statement. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that, yeah. Zach. L looking at how, you know, how few students we have per nurse compared to the end quality standards, is there any opportunity to use telehealth for some of that for nurses at other schools? Is that even medically appropriate? Um, is that something that we have looked at or could look at? So one of the things that was talked about last year um, when we were looking at more across the board removing the ESSER positions is using a school nurse leadership model which takes, uh, it, it allows a district to say how will we utilize the resources we have so that it's, uh, there's the example you would give is there's someone who plays the role of coordinating and deciding, so if it's uh, vision and hearing testing in Doty, a resource goes over there, um, that's likely, and then if telehealth is something, um, then that might come out of that. Uh, you know, I think schools in Vermont have, that are small have had partial FTE for a long time. It doesn't mean there's not a plan in place for what happens when the nurse isn't there. Um, so. Also, um, uh, comment about it also is it, it would be going back to the pre-COVID FTE but not necessarily the pre-COVID structure of having a nurse who is two days at Doty and three days two, two days at Doty and three days at Callis but that it might be that at Doty what we're looking for is a part-time position that where we have a nurse in the building every day who covers high frequency visit times. Um, so pre-COVID staffing levels doesn't mean pre-COVID scheduling. Um, this is based off of what um, Megan was talking about, like the coordination of the nurses and our resources. How do we do that now? Is it just they talk amongst themselves right in, now? Informally. Okay. I want to second McKaylin's concerns specifically about nursing, um, and I wonder about the the desire to have in this climate and as a healthcare professional to to acquire an, an, an employee for a designated couple of hours to get high flyers in a climate where staffing is incredibly challenging. That that seems very pie in the sky. 
from a, a available, like available people perspective, unless you know perhaps the person who's in that position is interested in that. Um, but that would be tailoring it to one individual, right? So that that just strikes me as a concern. I'm all for full time staffing, and I think the EQSs are incredibly high. Um, as an elementary school employee in a school with two nurses trying to serve a big population, it just um, it worries me. The idea of not having full time nursing in every building, regardless of what we did before, I don't think it was great before. Thank you, Maggie. And Ursula, and then I'm going to open it up to, I, I want to make sure that everybody mm -hmm. gets a chance to at least, even if there's not a concern, just to what did they see in the presentation or a highlight or what make them aware or if they have a particular direction. So I'm going to go so I have a question Ursula. that wasn't in the nursing. So. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Go ahead. Okay. I was curious and I wanted to hear from our administration. Um, cuts have been proposed that get us close to that number that would keep us below the tax rate th um, review threshold. And I guess, what what is your feeling on how, how doable is it to get that number reduced further to get us to that threshold? Because I know Carolyn talked that it's a lot of work to, do go, to go through that. I hate to put you through it to realize it's not achievable too. From my point of view, I thought that was our goal in the budget work that we did for the past month, and we weren't able to hit it. That, but that's just my perspective. I think to add to that, the list that I didn't share with you with those three other bullets of, right, we could look at the Allied Arts, we could look at um, Stephen's intervention. The reason that there we could, I think that would be the next place we would go, and the reason they're not on the list of recommendations is because we don't wholeheartedly recommend them. I would add a callus, and I will let um, Gillian speak for Jody. We are a really small school, and at some level, it is hard to imagine how to maintain the current level of service. Um, and it, that weighs on me because I recognize that we are taking um, a disproportionate amount of the resources for our very small school. And if we stay configured in the way we currently are, we need it to function. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just think the board needs to be knowledgeable. I'll take anything you want to give us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say for U32 that when we come to a decision like this, we really look at U32 as being, since it is the most efficient in terms of the dollar per pupil, we look at it as being the first place to cut to get to those numbers. I would say to you that this discussion is going to get really big in two years when U32 starts to drastically drop in its enrollment. Um, and that will be the better time to have the discussion about reconfiguring um, some of the U32 programs. I would also say that if the board said that we needed some additional cuts that there are some places within our budget that we could probably streamline a little bit more, but we are getting close to program cuts when we start to do that. Um, to be fair, um, and I will say this, the board didn't ask about the cuts at U32 when we looked at the slides. Um, the two paraprofessional positions are two of five empty positions that we have. So we didn't cut any people. Um, we just are realizing, we're, we're coming to the realization that we can't fill positions anymore, and so we have to look at other ways to do that. Can I follow up? Uh, just a clarifying question. Um, we found $890,000 in savings, and we're comparing that to the 920000 to avoid, that's our best guess, as to how to, how to avoid the tax rate review. So it's a yes. $30,000 gap, correct? Yes, okay. to Thank our you. best guess number. Thank you. Which is the right way to rephrase it. And, and sorry, if I could just follow up on that really quickly. Is it also safe to assume that a lot, given that you said the, the average that they're guessing right now is an average 12, point, 12 points, a lot of schools, a lot of oh, districts yes. are gonna be in that tax rate review. And if we went into that, Thirty thousand dollars over, the penalty probably wouldn't be that large. Those are all safe assumptions. It gets 
Is there any penalty? I mean, just be maybe a review. Sure. Right? Um, Especially considering that our tax rate would have gone down significantly because of the change because of April 27. So, Stephen, based on what you just said, am I understanding that the two cuts are not even filled? So currently, we have a need for 15 paraprofessionals at U32. Next year, we'll have a need for 18, given our current estimates of student need. We have five open positions right now. We could very well have eight open positions next year. So cutting those two positions are positions we haven't been able to fill. Okay, so there's, and are all the other cuts, the ones that are currently filled? I mean, that no. is, no. which ones are not? Uh, the point three math interventionist at oh, Callis, at Callis oh, currently the, the, is not filled. The person okay. does point seven already. I mean, that, that to me is a much different gloss with these numbers because it, you're not reducing a U32 positions that are actually filled and serving student populations, whereas in these other schools you are, except for the point where you math. But they're budgeted. But let, me, let me be clear. We need to fill them. those positions. Yeah. Yeah. I know, but, you, they, but they're not filled now, and you're not. But which is why we're cutting back some of those positions to make these numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's, a, Chris is right, there's a psychological difference at least between riffing people mm -hmm. and cutting open positions. Mm -hmm. Understood. And, yeah. and, I, and I think I that's, a, I'm going to let Josh, go ahead, Megan. No, you can let Josh go. Because no. you've been waiting for a minute. No. No. no? Okay. Right. So I just want to point out one of our lenses is equitable distribution of resources. And Kat sort of um, talked about this. We aren't fully equitable, meaning our smallest schools take a bigger percentage of resources, which frankly leaves U32, which serves the biggest population of our kids, with the smallest percentage of our resources. So if we were to say, um, soften some of the reduction in those smallest buildings, it would make that disproportionality worse. So that's just something the board should understand. It makes that um, dynamic, uh, it increases the gap. And what are the criteria for proportionality? Uh, it's pretty simple. 57% of the students in this district attend U32 and 47% of your personnel. Okay. And I think we should go around. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's say, I'm going to let Jonathan, because he's online, go first. Jonathan. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I just wanted to express my concerns. Um, that have been shared by a few people already about the cuts to both nursing and counseling. And I'll just say, I guess, really similar things that I said last year, which was that everything I've read about uh, the youth mental health crisis in this country um, among young people is real. And uh, while we have a unique district in many ways, uh, we're all people and our kids are all people too. And so I think many of the things that are afflicting uh, the mental health crisis among young people are also afflicting the th children in our district and students in our district. So I would very much be opposed to cutting um, nursing positions, counseling positions, other mental health type positions. I think that's completely counter uh, to our stated one of our stated elements and mission, which is to provide safe and healthy schools for our students. So to me, that's a priority right now, very much so. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, um, I'm going to go one side and one side so everybody gets. I don't want to put you on the spot. Yeah, no, no, I have a question actually. Um, you said that the, so in Berlin and East Montpelier, there's the reduction of the one classroom teacher in each. And I heard somebody say that wasn't actually a budgetary cut, it was a lack of enrollment cut. Oh. And can you just explain it is a how that works and where that comes from? It is from a budgetary then? cut, okay. but, it's, but it's related right, to right, enrollment right. as opposed to we're reducing for change in program or because of a loss of grant funds, which is what the other ones were. This is just we have fewer students and we can maintain our class size ratios even with one fewer student in both buildings based on what we know now. Okay. And so like is that something that is planned and you know what grade that comes out of already? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. 
Kari, because you have had a chance to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, um, so I'm trying to keep in mind uh, Floor's comments about perseverance, um, because uh, this is this is really difficult. That these kinds of reductions, it's painful to contemplate this, and yet asking, still asking our town people to accept a 13 percent increase in spending that I'm not at all comfortable with that um, so it's it's actually hard to know like what ought to be the target so I really appreciate your leadership and everybody putting this together it, uh, means a lot um, I personally would like like to see further reductions but I think this is going to be difficult enough and so I think this is a reasonable um, place to move um, model to move forward with and I would say the last thing is that Keep in mind that the, we are here because there are very real trends, real drivers to this situation. The student enrollment is not getting better, it's getting worse. And affordability is, is going to continue to be um, harder. And so these kinds of changes feel inevitable. And last year we didn't make reductions, and that makes this year that much harder. And so I don't. I would urge us not to put off things that will make next year harder. Thank you, Kari. Okay. Daniel, oh, I get to go. Um, I guess I was. I'll use my time to sort of second what Jonathan said, and I. I think. Um, I appreciated what you said, Megan, about about equity and equitable distribution of resources. I think if we all wrote down how we would how we would allocate resources in the district equitably we would all have a different you know we would have 17 or 15 different um, ways of approaching that so I think there are a lot of different ways of looking at equity I guess I I hear what Stephen said and I think it's, it's at our peril to cut those positions even if they're open I also think thinking about what Jonathan said, that we have to think about the upstream interventions in terms of social and emotional learning that we can maybe take and or, or preserve. Maybe it's a, an intervention we preserve by keeping nursing positions and school counseling positions at the elementary level. And maybe, maybe over time they pay off in needing fewer paraprofessionals for behaviorally challenged or um, well for behavioral challenges in our schools at you know our high school so I I think we should find an additional 30,000 in um, reductions I also don't want to see the nursing positions and the counseling positions cut so I would <laughs> want to see uh, <laughs> something different than what we have in front of us. Um, I wasn't prepared to speak yet. Um, <laughs> you can, if I call I'm you, gonna you can listening. always pass. I'm going to okay. keep listening. Okay. Uh, Natasha. Sorry, Chris. I'm not trying to be... No, I'm going to go again. Natasha. Um, I know that, that last year we made decisions not to be any pets, um, and, we, and we did that knowing it was going to make decisions more difficult in the future. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm, my I'm always going to believe that we shouldn't cut any of our staff. Um, I was an educator. It worked for the union. I don't ever want to cut staff. Um, and I also feel very strongly about not cutting the nursing and counseling. I think if, if COVID showed us nothing else, it's that our students need to have those supports in a way that we were not aware that they needed them before. Um, having said all of that, I also understand the reality of where we're at. <laughs> um, that's where my head is at right now. Okay. Thank you, Natasha. Echoing, um, I think, the general consensus that we're concerned about the social emotional well-being of the students um, and there's a lot of really 
difficult decisions um, based on the limited resources and this really messed up equation that <laughs> at the Vermont School Board Association conference, people from all across the state were sharing their concerns um, that the way that the factors come into play does not reflect the need um, and the numbers that we, that we have um, and, and the process is a strange one where we're sort of learning what we're going to have to work with after um, mm -hmm. votes come in. So um, I also don't want to see the counselors and nurses nursing positions be cut. And I also am appreciating the support that the administration and the teachers have been providing through COVID to students. Um, and I'm curious to learn more about, you know, how, how the school structures have functioned to fill in those gaps where um, students have needed extra support. And we did learn from the social emotional support presentations that were given, um, kind of the policies and systems that have been put into place. Um, and so I think given the reality of what we're faced with and the creativity and the resilience of the schools and the staff and people coming together, I feel like even with the cuts that we can support the students and find ways to, to make it work um, until those positions can be, can be filled and when that's determined that that's essential and needed again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Diane. So just a few clarifications. And again, I'm not, I'm not calling this into question. I just need some understanding. So under, you know, when I'm looking at the overall budget and the different increases in different areas under salary, so like under superintendent, the increase of almost 150,000, is, is that that additional position we were talking about? Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, and that, and so I'm just trying to get, and then the um, operation and maintenance, that's like 230,000, is that, what is that covering in terms of salaries? Is that two new people? I'm just trying to get a sense of. There is one position that was created to cover both Dodie and Rumney, mm -hmm. and it's like an increase of 0.4. That was in the baseline budget. That's why we didn't highlight it in the list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it is an increase over last year. Mm -hmm. um, equipment, supplies, things but like that. But that wouldn't be, th this is solely on the salary line. Mm -hmm. So that, that was why it's I'm just probably to... just the salary increases mm -hmm. that we're estimating. Mm -hmm because that also doesn't include the benefits. Yeah. So, you know, just trying to get a sense of, of where and, and um, just a better understanding of it. The, the other uh, thing, in terms of that 1.0 at East Montpelier, and I know last year, we, we put it in for last year, right? Was that a new position last year? Two years, two years ago? And, yeah, it was in two years ago, and it was part of the package from last year that was recommended. And so we considered that this year a gift mm -hmm. um, of a teacher that we did, um, we, we abused that gift and also felt like, again, it's we, because this year's kindergarten class is smaller and next year's kindergarten class is also coming in and we only need one. We have 21 kindergartners this year in one classroom because we, do, we truly did not believe two classes of 10 and 11 were best for our students, um, we have a similar scenario next year, and we're graduating two sixth grade classes, so it's it was in there two years ago. Okay, thank you. And then, so then just a couple of things, so um, um, my understanding, it isn't necessarily a penalty that we would have under that review, but... Um, <coughs> But if there's a large number, my understanding too is if there's a large number of school systems that go and get granted this cap, 
that also is going to create kind of like Archimedes tub where it's going to then ripple to then we, you know, even though we're saving, we're not saving kind of a thing, which seems to be the... And it affects that property yield. So that yes. property yield is all dependent on how much everybody's budgets go up. Yeah. And so the more everybody's goes up, the property exactly. yield is affected, so then that affects the tax rate anyway. Yeah, exactly. That's why that property yield is a factor that's super important. Yeah. Yeah. So that. And then um, and then just the last thing is I abs and and I appreciate that again administration brought forward what your recommendations are and what your understanding is even understanding that we can't make it what you're talking about your cuts and that um, and so and last so keeping those three pillars in mind um, and everything else I also know we are going to start to hear from our communities and we are going to start to hear lots of different stories of the impacts and that and all I'm saying is to me those all feed into the puzzle this is a huge piece of the puzzle that you brought forward that we as being fiscally responsible, being um, also in, you know, wanting to be equitable, wanting to be also um, able to manage these things um, responsibly, to me that also just begins to fill in the story. So I don't want, um, I have every intention of considering all of these parts, but I, don't, I want to be transparent that I also hear stories and that just feeds into the equation. Joshua. Yeah. Um, so I know, Megan, you said at the beginning that none of the reductions, n none of, no reconfiguration was looked at in terms of the reductions. So um, with the exception of the Doty and Romney um, right. K and the K. Which was based more on egg quality class size. standards. Mm -hmm. Yes. That. To have the, the, a reasonable size class for good instruction. Yes. I guess, um, well, first I'll say that I appreciate this work and I think it's a good step. I think it's a good start. Um, what I'm starting, what we're starting to hear everybody, say, most folks say, which was something that reminded me of last year. like. Um, oh, like, I want Spanish, too. I mean, you know, that sort of thing. Like, I want, our children deserve full-time nurses. So, um, I guess what I would say was, um, I, I wonder, and it's a question, is it too, is it way too soon to think about larger reconfiguration, or is it just going to turn out very poorly if we try that now? So it, this is a conversation our leadership team has had quite a bit because I think we feel very strongly that we could be configured in a way that lets us do much more to the point that you're making. Oh, um, I'm sorry. And I'll say, uh, uh, also recognizing that infrastructure costs are second to staff costs, mm -hmm. correct? And, and just that the fact that we have to care for so much yes. buildings, oh, too, yeah. we would, one could realize savings in that realm. Right. Sorry. No, nope, that's okay. What the, the two things, and there might be more, but the two things at top of mind around configuration, one is simply the amount of community engagement that yeah. this board and frankly the community has asked for related to big mm -hmm. configuration, and that mm -hmm. takes time. Yeah. And that would be really hard to pull off. And the second piece that we talked about a little bit is we could make certain moves. The problem is if you make a move, and you don't know what that long-term configuration is, you may have made a move that makes this hard. Mm -hmm. The example we were talking about at leadership is, let's say you moved a grade over to U32, mm -hmm. sixth grade up, but then later the configuration study said, oh no, you know what, we should, build a, we should use one of our buildings for a middle school. Mm -hmm. Now you've just zigzagged. Mm -hmm. So that's the other risk that you would take in moving a configuration faster, mm -hmm. is you may you may, time might get you to a more judicious, like, oh, this is really where we want to be, but we did something over here. Those are the two things that jump out. Thank you. Can I ask for a little clarity on your facilities, your facility statement, though? Your uh, only because I know, you know, it, it costs a lot to keep these buildings going, and every year we're putting more and more maintenance into them, whether it's upgrading our pellet 
uh, or pellet systems or improving ramps, um, which all these things need to happen, mm -hmm. regardless if we're underutilizing the facilities or using them to capacity. Um, I feel strongly about that. But I just know that that would represent savings as well. Yeah. Are you? Yeah, I'm finished. Okay. Here's a question. Okay. Um, I, just, I just wanted to get back to the equity thing, and I understand that equity does not mean offering the same thing in every school, but it seems to me that with nursing and counseling being so like basic needs, and when I look at how things are currently distributed, it looks like um, you know, Doty already is the one school that doesn't have band, for example, or the one school that doesn't have a dedicated health educator, or health educator position that's covered by others. I think the nurse and the counselor are the ones doing the health education at Doty. Yeah, that was actually a, a conscious decision um, on my part. Uh, not not a, a budget. The nurse position at Doty has always been funded through um, little bits and pieces. You know, I, I inherited it. I was checked with Suzanne. There are about 27 different piles of money that funded nursing. Um, and the uh, part of what it came out of was when we moved up to having the full-time nurse with COVID and then just the change in personnel and the difference in the interest. It, turned, it just organically happened in that first Maureen and Jess and now Maureen and Lydia just have the, they have the like teaching mojo and chemistry and rhythm to to do, have the nurse. Which is beautiful, health. but yeah. each other school has, you know, point two health educator and we're looking at taking away point seven of the two people that are doing the health education ability just seems not fair to Doty. Um, and I don't want to cut anyone either. I really don't. And But, you know, if it were, you know, last year I know there was a lot of talk about, you know, the Spanish position. And I'd love all our students, all of our elementary students to have Spanish. But, like, if it were between one school having Spanish and all the schools having a nurse, I'd rather have all the schools yeah. have a nurse. Thank you. Thank you. Maggie? I, I, McKaylin's like speaking my mind, so I, I second those things. I also um, appreciate the um, complexity and all of the work that you as an administrative team collaboratively have done and the hard conversations you have been having for years about our changing demographics. Um, but I, I second that wholeheartedly. I would much rather have health care providers in every building full time than Spanish in, in one or two schools. Thank you. Yeah. Ursula. I'm going to take a moment to reiterate everything Kari said, because I agree with all the things he said. This budget number is hard to see. Um, I didn't like it when I saw it, I'm going to be honest. Um, between my work in the finance committee and tonight's meeting though, I really appreciate the work and the time the administration team has put into giving us this recommendation and having to think about those cuts because that's your community and your people. I would love to see more cuts if we could, but it doesn't sound like it is entirely feasible this year to cut more. And so I very much appreciate this recommendation. I am going to definitely plug trusting our administrators to tell us what our students need and what their schools need and to trust in that and to remind us all that last year we did not make cuts for a variety of reasons but we did say like we know it's coming next year and it is now next year and they are here and we can't keep putting them off. We have community members and I understand all of our staff are community members and cuts affect our community, but the people who live in our community are also part of our community. Not everybody in our community could afford a budget that doesn't have any cuts. And those families who experience that hardship 
because of our increased education spending, homes with financial difficulties have kids who struggle at school. And so that's a direct impact to one of our pillars. And that's why I'm going to say. Thank you, Ursula. Zach. Oh, I'll pass for them. Um, so one of the reasons why we've been talking for the last two years about so deeply about our budget and our configuration and our spending level is because our spending was high and our taxes were high and our spending was near the top if not at the top of per pupil spending. I wonder where do we land? And like this whole Act 127, right, is about resetting what the expectations are for what it costs to educate different students, right? And I think we, we owe Scott and Dorothy, right, a lot of thanks for their work um, in Montpelier on that. Where would we fall? So my computer died, so I can't give you the exact number, but I did look at that. Um, we're not at the top anymore. We're more like in the top uh, third. Okay. I think I can't remember the. I don't want to throw a number out, but it was like the top third. So it it sort of right sized us a little bit. Okay. It made us not look so very expensive for people. And there were a number. Of, so the the proposal that we saw today, with if if that was what we went with, right? And there are some things that are unknown. You're very confident that our tax rate would in fact go down because of that reweighting and the recalculation of. Per, per, per student spending, essentially. I mean, yeah. probably not like 95 cents. Like, that seemed really Yeah, no, I, it's not going to do that. It's not going to no. do that. But, and, and, I, I, and, and, I, and I, I hear you, but I just want to make sure that we have the facts, like what the tax rates are going to look like and what our spending looks like. But I really like. think she can answer the, that. The I'm thing really that I don't fine. know, Jonas, is that property yield. Right, that's that the is piece I don't know. By a large that's number right. Of so Look, don't hold Suzanne. I'm tonight. not holding Suzanne. Okay. <laughs> I think I have not held Suzanne <laughs> to a stay for the last year. <laughs> I have <laughs> asked her for a lot. <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 my point is, right, that I want, you know, I just want to keep that in mind, right? That as we talk about cuts, as we talk about the impact on the community, and as we talk about the impact on education quality and on student experience and on our staffing levels, um, and as we look at that raw number, right, 40-something million dollars, right, is terrifying. Um, but there are other factors, and the reweighting is a significant change in how education is funded, right, and what our per student costs look like compared to other districts, which is how the money gets distributed. So that's for that, you know, I would vote for this budget today. I think it will change. Um, and I, but I, I think it's done in good faith by the, by the administrators. No one wants to lose staff. No one wants to lose nurses. But we got along, you know. You. Some of this is going to be tightening belts. So, you know, I hear you. Thank you, Jonas. Chris? Okay. And then I'll go back to you, sir. So, Alicia, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. Um, the <laughs> staff member that East Montpelier is losing, was that the staff member that was going to be lost by attrition anyway? Was that the two-year staff member that we talked about two years ago? The, I, I don't want to talk people, right? Mm -hmm. Since then, yeah. there has been turnover, there's been retirement, there's been new hires, other things have happened. But I will say the position is the position, if you remember, that you had funded as a one-year position yeah. because we had an increase over the COVID years. We had a lot of families move in. And that was going to be a one-year and we were going to revisit it. And it's been two years because last year we stayed status quo with our staffing. So, back to my question, is that a staff member who is considered to be like a temporary addition to meet an increased need um, that each month period had at that time? Any staff member in their first two years are temporary, right? Yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't think I can talk people, but it is, it is that, that position that you all approved to add because of an increase in enrollment that we had 
um, where last year's, this year's kindergarten and next year's kindergarten no longer support that increase. Okay, thank you. That's, that's I just want to talk to people yeah. because it could be one of several people who have been hired since that before the attack. Oh, okay. okay, thank you. Um, so, Mike, you know, I just don't like these budget cuts. Um, uh, well, I don't like these staff cuts. Budget cuts are fine, but staff cuts are not. I'm not favorable, favorable to. Um, and uh, you know, I, I just, I think if we're going to have these um, staffing cuts, they should be uh, more equitably across the board and include administration. Uh, if we can bind the Rumney pre-K and the Doty pre-K uh, in the kindergartens, uh, then it doesn't seem to me that we couldn't also combine some administration as well. Uh, the in, the uh, superintendent's office, I think, went up by 36 percent, if I'm not mistaken, this year increase. Uh, and I can and recognize the need for, for that. There's been other pretty significant increases. Diane talked about the operations uh, going up by about 20 percent or so. Um, and guidance services going up 32 percent. And I know we had increased salaries this year. Uh, but the, the cuts are not equitably distributed, in my view. It's falling more uh, harshly upon the elementary schools. U32 is losing two powers that they don't even use right now. They'd love to have them, but they don't have them, and it doesn't look like the market is going to increase in that. Uh, and, and we're making choices here. I mean, there, there could be other things that could be considered to be cut um, uh, and addressed. Um, and I'm going to I know this is going to come blow back on me, but how much do we fund for the equity scholar? Equity scholar. How much is that as a as a budget item? If you know. I will tell you. We don't we don't pay full full uh, even paying the position too. We don't actually we we pay full amount. But what I'm going to say is just doesn't even sort of capture the amount of work that, the, you know, it's not I'm like the bill you know, So, but I don't, I want to move us away from yeah. trying to pick positions, Chris, because, the, you know, what the equity, so just for my These are positions that are being cut. You know, the, the, just, there should be no sacrosanct positions, really, if we're talking about, especially with direct services to students. And, and I think that's really where, to me, where the harm comes in, is that we have direct services to students, and I know everyone has a impact on our students across the system. Uh, but when we're miss missing nurses and, you know, we, and, um, I guess Jonathan talked about the mental health, we keep hearing about the mental health crisis in our schools and we're cutting counselors, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, it, because it does, it does, it, I'm not hearing that kids are better. I'm not hearing that the, the need has dissipated, but we're making choices here and my choice would be to Look for other budgetary cuts, not in the staff that's directly serve our students. Um, Can I say something? Go ahead. Um, I think we need to be careful about comparing certain cuts. Um, for example, like the combining the kindergarten and the pre-K. Those, from what I understand, are to maintain um, educational quality standards. So when you compare that to, say, uh, some administrative position, that comparison may not be apples to apples. These things are contextual. Well, what's, what's that? The education quality standards are a quali quantitative, not a qualitative measure. Is that right, Megan? Mm -hmm. right. And my understanding is that we're over capacity from administration, or are we under capacity for administration using the Vermont educational quality standards? For administration, we're actually within a quality standards because they measure it by a number of uh, within teachers means what? Hmm? Within means what? Within means the range? Their ratio is every time you have 10 professionals, you need a full-time principal to serve them, and we meet that. We, we don't exceed that. We have differences amongst some of this team supervises more people, but we have 10 professionals that need supervision in each one of our buildings. So we need it. Don't We don't exceed it. Have, have we been overstaffed in terms of our student needs over the past year? 
I, I'm not really understanding your question. In terms of our actual treatment need, need mm -hmm. have we been overstaffed in terms of our nurses, our counselors, mm -hmm. the people being, the positions that are being cut, uh, are we overstaffed in terms of our actual need for what our students need? Your leadership team including us, has brought you a budget that we believe sufficiently staffs us. That's not my question. And that's uh, the way I'm going to answer your question, though, okay, Chris, so because then, we okay. have a budget that we are recommending to you that we believe meets student needs. Okay. Um, so we had a very good comment, I think, from our Worcester resident saying we shouldn't, I don't think we should say that their student needs will be robustly met and, and things like that because I don't think that is actually possible when we're making the number of cuts that we are making here. Um, we should recognize that we probably will not be providing the type of services that we have been providing to our students because of the cuts. It just make, it doesn't make any sense that we wouldn't be, unless we're saying that we've been overstaffed for the past year, uh, and I don't think we have, we have to. Anyway, that's my, that's my, yeah. that's my position. Mind, do you mind if I, I respond? I don't want to put the administration on the spot, but I think, Chris, there's no magic number. There's no magic number that this is exactly what we need, and more than that is, is, is we're overstaffed, and under is understaffed. There's an alchemy. Listen, listen to Gillian. Completely agree. Yeah, and then the other thing that I want to remind us, I want to get sacked, because I want to do a check on time, too, but the other thing that I wanted to remind us is what Megan keeps saying, you know, this, that they came back to us with uh, responsible cuts that they felt was what it was responsible. Just let me finish. That was uh, that that was what was the responsible thing to best meet the needs of all of our students. Are we the professionals in charge of the students, or are they the professionals? So I I just want us to caution ourselves when we start to go with specific positions that we are not the experts, right? We pride ourselves of hiring and supporting the best staff to come to us with those recommendations. That's all I want to say. Zach. I hear a lot of angst about what we're, you know, what we're going to be doing about providing nursing and, 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 and mental health. I think it might be really valuable for the board to get some more information about like how we're actually going to meet those needs. Because I know that I mean, certainly during the course of the pandemic, you know, how we provide health care has changed wildly. You know, even the course of four days, I've seen it change wildly. And so I, but I think it might be helpful to get a little bit more, more of that picture of how are we going to meet the needs in some of those places that have been where, where, where we are seeing decreases. Um, I also wonder, and, you know, and I don't know if this is sort of out, you know, out of turn in terms of you know, role of, you know, we, we have these, these arts you know, positions where you know, you know, we have fewer classes, we have, you know, we, have, you know, we, need, we need a point nine, we have a one. Are there other roles those, that some of those teachers can help on some of the student support where we do have the, these needs, maybe not at the level of, you know, they need someone who's licensed in mental health, but, you know, are, are there ways that we can try to fill those gaps creatively? Yeah, I want to um, add to that. As a psychotherapist and someone who grew up in a school with a lot of supportive teachers where the, actually the counselor wasn't always available, and then going into the field and appreciating the role, the, the dual roles that a lot of the teachers just naturally fill because they care about the kids and they're supportive. And so I am also interested in learning um, more, and I don't know if it's appropriate to like provide that as a question right now, but to sort of get a little feedback in terms of how you understand um, the comprehensive support that the students are getting from the entire school, and perhaps certain teachers more than others, or Right, because it's not it's not always the role of the counselor, and sometimes the counseling position is actually limited to give more attention to certain students or to do other tasks like preparing for continuing education. But so the question I hear that I think is a really good question that the administration could bring you more information yeah. about is what does service delivery look like yeah. in a model that has these proposed reductions. Um, because I think one of the comments that I would make in response to some of this is um, the leadership team did have choices to make about which positions to cut and based on what they know about their systems what we collectively know about our systems 
we made those decisions. If there was a decision to, to externally have someone say, put this position back, we would have to go find it in another place, and it may be a place that they would not recommend. And that is... something that would be difficult. So um, I do think it makes sense to have some information about what does the system of support look like within each building, um, because I think that's important. Can I just, can dive into that Mark, later. Could, Mark, yeah, go ahead. Can I say, we Mark. have seen, um, at least from Caroline at Rumby, like what that support and really looks I'm like. Sorry. Oh. Tyler, Tyler Smith wants to get into the meeting. Oh, I, thank you, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted us all to remember what, from Caroline's presentation at Romney, what some of that robust support can look like. Um, I don't remember exactly, I'm sorry, if that was delivered by the nurse or by other teachers or by Caroline herself, but that support was there. Um, so we have already got a glimpse into what that system looks like. And each school does something different. And that's, we're hearing from the principals that at one, but like that's the theme of our monthly meetings. So we can bring, like Megan said, maybe we can make that part of the data that we need for our community engagement uh, part of this so people understand. Can I just clarify a question just request, just because I feel like it's going to be, the more of the implication, you were asking about if, how would we, um, so, for example, with, with a reduction in the DOTI nursing staff, your question would be, what is currently happening now with the reduced FTE? Obviously, not all that would happen by that one person, so how would we fill that need? What would be our, our plan? For that, I, I just want to make sure that I get you. Yeah, or, or maybe, maybe even, or I think, I think get very focused on, we, we have a, we have a full-time nurse, and then we're going to have a less than full-time nurse, shouldn't we have a full-time nurse? And maybe to reframe it as, here are the needs that a nurse needs to meet. How, how are we going to meet these needs? I think I think what I like the question how Megan phrased it. I said, "What does the service delivery model looks like for the needs right now?" Um, that's I think what we need to give the the picture to the public and to the board is what the needs are right now and what that delivery system is going to look like with the staff that you're proposing. Just that I don't I don't think we need to dig into what was pre-COVID or whatever. This is where we have now. What is the what are we doing to serve our students? Uh, I think that did I. Get everybody. And there's well, we've got Jonathan. Okay. So I, I have a couple I have a couple of things I just that, that I was thinking as I was hearing everybody that I want to remind us I don't I that and I think uh, Suzanne mentioned this a little bit that we don't operate in isolation of the rest of the state and we very much affect the rest of the state and that very much affects our own tax rates. So to keep that in mind every time we think about, you know, maybe we'll come, it'll be a little more favorable for us at 127, and this bank on, you know, some savings here. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really want us to have that, that attitude. I much rather have the attitude of like, let's be sustainable <laughs> with, with where we wanna go in the future with the district. I am interested, I'm really thankful for the exercise that you guys went through, and I know that it's really hard to put positions and you know I, I I really still feel like we need to do more and I don't know what that <laughs> looks like but I am interested in looking at uh, considering the pre-k uh, the, the pre-k part I think we've been talking about it for a couple of years and I know that that is hard so I'm not saying that it's uh, or or, and this is completely crazy, so you guys can say no completely, is that I keep hearing this thing about, you know, nurses and, 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 and counselors. I, do we need to really think about some configuration before our time? And I'm just putting this out. <laughs> this, in, if, we, if our goal is to have a counselor and a nurse in order to pass a budget, 
you know, like if I'm counting the numbers and going around here, if that is a requirement of the board, we need to configure differently. I just, we can't, it's an impossible goal. So I, I'm just putting that out there by listening to all of you. That's what was making me, you know, nervous. And you said we need to do more. Do you mean we need to find more cuts? Is that what you're saying? I, yeah, I think we need to, to find more cuts, but I'm thinking, the, the crazy idea is that I'm thinking that in order to satisfy the desire of the board to have a counselor and a nurse and at every school, and right now it's looking like the majority of the board, we need to do some configuration change in order to to have to have that be possible. It's not sustainable to have a nurse at each school. Just put it back and go, we just can't do it. And it might be late, and it might be tired, and I might not be making sense, but this is what you guys were making me think. So it, we were clear as mine, probably, at staff, I don't know. So I'm going to pick up the thread that Caroline very articulately, we need really concrete direction. And if we don't receive a concrete direction, and, and frankly, I think that should be a financial direction so that we can decide how best to use the resources. If not, I don't know what we would bring back to you other than what we just brought to you. And, and Caroline's point is a real one. If you tell us to go, we will. But we, we um, there's a lot of damage that happens when you start to broaden that net. Mm -hmm. And that's just hard and that's just part of the process and that's fine, but if that then gets walked back, that's where, that's where it's challenging. So I would ask the board for really concrete direction. I hear loudly that you want at the next budget meeting more information about what, what it looks like with these um, reductions that we're proposing. That absolutely makes sense to me. Um, but if you would like us also to move in either direction, quite frankly, we need to know a number, right? So that if, like, achieve the 919, then, then, that, then we will go and look at achieving the 919. Um, I would not recommend uh, telling us not to cut anything. I, I think if we have a financial direction, we will come back to you taking in all of this information and make some recommendations, but I think it's gotta be concrete. When, when we were at the finance committee, we were talking about, we, we have 850,000 right now in reductions, more or less. It's 890 in, 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 now. Yeah. Yep. 890, so we are a little better. So, And we were saying that we are 2.9% above where, we want, yeah. to nine, where we want to be. So it's got to be somewhere in between there that, you know, you know, in my mind on Tuesday when we were having this meeting, we were all like, well, we need to figure out this 2.9, right? Mm -hmm. So now, I just if you're looking for concrete, is it half of that? Is it two percent? It's it's a lot, right? So, well, what I, what I'm hearing, and and again, I'm not. So, we've talked about this. That you know, the the challenge is what is, and we heard this at the community forum at the beginning of this month. What exactly are we asking our communities to understand in terms of cuts? And so, to me, there's this big, I don't, the only difference that I keep hearing from people is what would be the difference if you put back in the counselors and the nurses. And I'm not, you know, that's all I'm hearing. The other cuts I'm, you know, uh, respectfully, Chris had, you know, raised those things. So, I'm not saying to rework it. I have a wondering. What does that look like if you, add, what, it, what are those cost savings specifically to those positions? Then the other part of it is, I still, this is the you know first time we've had a chance to dive into it, so I don't know what I would hear out in the communities. I'm not saying that would then make me go back and say to you, put it all back in. I'm just saying I don't, you know, right now I'm fine with going forward with having more information about what those specific amounts are. Um, what I'm hearing loud and clear is this is as, as far down as you can go. So we as a board have to decide if we do accept all of these, we're still going to be above. Um, and so is that what we're okay with? Or are we asking, you know, I'm not hearing from anybody that we want them to go back and find the 30,000 extra. 
Oh, maybe Jonas is saying it. I think that's. I, a, I think that's that's yeah. a, that's, a, that's a solid target. That's a solid target based in state policy, right, and and state decision making. It's a small number to find, like, and you know, I mean, we could probably bear it next year with spending an extra thirty thousand dollars, right? But I think as the exercise, you know, if you know, unless we're like, this is this is this is what we're going to go with, if we're going to go back and do another draft, I'd I'd like to see the, that, you know. I'm, I'd like to get under that that threshold. To, to be clear, thirty thousand yeah. is not going to get you yeah. under the ten percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It will take nine hundred thirty-eight thousand to get you under the ten percent now. Yes, but we're at eight hundred. Nine hundred. No, no. Oh, more. 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 Yeah, because it was three hundred thousand per one. Then I want to see. Then I want to see what that looks like. I want to see what. Yeah. You would I do. Accept it. We're <laughs> talking about 11 positions or so right now. Yeah. It would be another 12. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't no, know. No, no, but the folks are saying that's not. No, no, no. I realize that. That's, no, that's, that's too much pain. Then, then I'd like, then I'd like to see what. I, you know, I mean, listen, I know it's too much pain. I've asked Suzanne for so much for the last 12 months. I know what the what the burdens on the administration are. But if we're talking about getting under under a threshold, if we're not going to, then it's, it's like. It's not the burden of the calculation. It's the burden of then telling 12 people you are potentially. Well, then we need to, then, then I think Floor is right. Then we need to be looking at this in combination with configuration changes. So sitting here tonight with the information that our administration knows, if we were to ask you to get under that threshold, which is an additional nine hundred and thirty-eight thousand dollars, is it doable while maintaining student services? Just stop. Just stop. No. <laughs> I want. I, I, so, is it possible to do? Yes. Is it a reconfiguration of programs at U thirty-two? Yes, because your elementary schools are taxed. So. If you are saying that you need to get to that point, your elementary schools have reached their limit of what they can do and maintain the services that they want to maintain. So what you're essentially asking is for me to go figure out what programmatic changes need to be done in U32 to reach this level. And those aren't, the, sorry, it's the only one I can point to and go back. We, we, we know where that goes in U32. Um, and is it possible? Yes. Is it pretty? No. So then, give, so given all of that, it sounds like we're at our limit unless we want to talk about real configuration changes. Further, further, right. I'm seeing all the heads for the camera, all the heads are nodding. So like, that's, that's as far as we can go. You mean infrastructurally or yes. programmatically? It, both. 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 Because to make programmatic changes for cuts, you need to make you know, infrastructure configuration changes. Where do people work and where do kids go to school? And I, and I don't think that we're there to do that. So the logical end point is, this is as far as we can go and the conversation is about which of these cuts the board may want to claw back. Yeah, so when I, I just wanted to make sure that Alicia and Celia, they both sort of were about to say something and do you, no, you're okay? Yeah. Can, Good. Okay. can someone review quickly um, the penalty if we stay at the 12.9% range versus the 10% range? It's a tax rate review. And Which may or may not be a fine. There's no yeah, fine. There's no fine. No no review by who? Yeah. I, I know that. Committee, yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> in, in yesterday's training, yeah. they, yeah. they yeah. actually yeah. talked about the makeup yeah. of that committee, and it's going to be... Solid three superintendents and three business administrators within the state. Yeah. Um, not they will not yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. has apparently yeah. not volunteered to do that. Um, <laughs> this way we don't want they to did not say that. that during the meeting. I'm just watching the face. Um, but that was what they, like, and I feel like that was kind of new information they had at yesterday's training. So they do know the makeup of that committee yeah, now. So it's going to be peers, like right. school district peers, exactly. not Legislators. Did they talk about what they could So what this is what whatever? this is what Based happens according to the other stuff. Is it then goes to the review what they will either grant you or not grant you is if they if they accept your conditions as to why you need to do it, they will cap you at five percent. But if not, if they don't accept it, 
then it could be even at more. Than That's what you have. the five percent cap is for your tax rate, though, yes. not your egg spending right. percent yeah. increase. And, yes, and then that affects the state yield because if your tax rate is higher than five percent, you will be capped at five percent. And so the example they gave is that if your tax rate is at eight percent and you get capped at five, that other three percent has to be made up made yeah, up somewhere so and we all know that it comes from the yield so it means the other towns who haven't yes. hit the cap are now getting more money taken from them and it can push other towns and other districts into that five percent cap which then requires yet another review of the yield and it goes on and on forever and <laughs> until they eventually have, have gotten done yeah, yeah. yeah. that, that, that is the yeah. right yeah. there's yeah. that like that's a lot. I don't like not knowing things. So. <laughs> the, I would add with the 5% that the school districts that are disadvantaged in this calculation from the, the equalized pupil change, that was put in to help them. Right. Yeah. And it's not necessarily, necessarily to help school districts that years. benefit. Yeah. My understanding with the tax review, if you hit that 10% threshold on the first student spending, is that if you go to tax review, you can lose that 5% cap. Not that we will maybe need it, but that 5% cap is there. You only get it one there. time. It, yeah, and if, if our tax rate goes down this year, we don't get it. Right, we don't get the cap right. Yeah. So it may not. Yeah, but we don't want to bank on that. We do not yeah. want to bank on it. Yeah. I, I agree. Okay. But I also am hearing that getting there is going to be a really moving mountains thing. So, so what are what are we asking our administrators to do? You know, I, I think we still are a little confusing. What we're asking, we're asking. I, I think that now I'm hearing that we're asking you to dig a little deeper in, into the cuts. We can get to that threshold, so we don't go into. I think we need to take a vote on that. Yeah, yeah there'd be a lot deeper. Yeah. Right? Like double? Yeah. yeah. Are we, are we yeah. really, it's, it's really a bad, is, is everybody really uncomfortable with doing, with exploring reconfiguration? Is it feasible to make the large scale reconfiguration moves that we need to make in order to see this change? Is so, it feasible for us to do it to be able to meet next year's budget? But I think that we've got a process in place. One, there's the True. reconfiguration group, there's the yeah. strategic planning. And so even if we, you know, we know there may be a consequence right now, but if we jump, to me, if we jump into that reconfiguration, right. like, you know, Megan said, Megan said, we could zig and zag. I think that for, for I, mean, I realize we don't know the exact number, but from, from, from what I'm hearing about the changes in the in the weighting, it seems like we have, you know, in terms of what the community can bear in taxes, it seems like we have maybe a one, basically a one year source of funds that can that can help us there. I would be comfortable using that if there was a way of binding a future board to <laughs> really reach yeah. us. And, 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 and I realize that. Like last year, we said we'll do it next year. We're doing what we've been last year. What we're talking about. Yeah. 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 Look at your south side. I want to acknowledge, the, I'm, I'm acknowledging the weak, weakness of my argument. If there's a weakness in my argument, I want, I want to acknowledge it. <laughs> well, can I, can I is, 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 is it a one year source of funding? I don't think it's that. No, it's just it's a not. change in the way things are weighted. It's a one-year yeah. cushion. It's a one-year yeah. cushion. It, it, it's, it's not actually a one-year source of funding, but it almost, I, I think like the, the considerations of when is it appropriate to lean on that or not, I think it acts very much in the same way. I agree. Yeah. And, I, and I think the important piece is it is a one-year, because after that, you've got a new, yeah. new, new base. base. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. then you will feel all of it. Plus, we have a plan in place of, you know, we're not just stopping. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 do, I do think the fact that there is a plan, there is a, there is a process actively in place, I think that does make it different than last year. It um, carries really really So well. what I would suggest is that we're a little bit in shock and punchy and yeah. <laughs> that we can't do anything but ask for a presentation on the delivery system in the future. We have a budget forum coming up. We know we're going to get feedback. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And I would suggest that we stick with this model for the time being. Oh, and the other thing was um, some itemization. Yeah. 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 And then we've got some time to think about it, gather feedback, 
I, I, I agree with Kari. I mean, I think that there's there would be something to be said. I mean, we've heard a number of times that like having a number, having a, a fiscal target to shoot for is important, but I think if we did that, we would just be pulling a number out of nowhere. Yeah. Because we're not gonna, without reconfiguration, we're not gonna meet that threshold, we would be pulling out some random number. But if we did pull out a random number, I would be interested in hearing like, the really painful news about what it would cost to cut another hundred thousand dollars from the budget, and like what that would really mean, or like another one percent. How about we put a one percent on it? But if, but if it's just an intellectual exercise, I don't yeah, think it's I don't think we want to put together a whole model. I think we'd just like to hear more. We can look at the packet from this time But it's not just hearing more. It's not just hearing more. It has real impacts. We taught. We like contemplated budget cuts last year and we lost people in our district qualified and like excellent experienced educators because they saw the writing on the wall that we were going to make cuts and you know they, they were probably right but it's not it's not just an intellectual exercise it's not just looking at a number so I, so can I, mean, I say one thing uh, yeah um, I grew up in Orange County which is a low-income district and they were really creative in how they kind of reached out to other groups to get social emotional support for their students. They had one counselor and they were often busy. <laughs> and like when they had time they would meet with their students, but they ended up teaming up with Dartmouth College um, students who were studying psychology and counseling and they would come and meet with a group of students and they would do this mentorship program and then they had another program that they developed that was sort of like adventure learning where they kind of did like camp activities like bonding to kind of like a peer support program and I don't know if that's something that you tried or thought about or could kind of like work into the services delivery um, to if you were to present that to the community in the future of like here's how we can sort of bolster the peer support structure that we already have you know for the social emotional so, yeah. um, once we get that more into the delivery thank you so yes, let's so just much. stay with everybody comfortable thumbs up with what Carrie just described, we're just going to stay as this and pass it to the finance committee after, and then we'll have a budget discussion as a, as a board and not sit on this for too long either, but we're keeping the budget as it is. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I have what I need. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Don't feel like you have to stay to the very Thank last so bit. I'm sorry to make it so late. It, it is guys. really late. I just want to make one comment. I would like to thank Ursula for what she pointed out because um, I deliberately chose Doty because I, I, be, I believe that education is a service profession and I believe in that the only thing that separates people is opportunity and I really am committed to um, supporting, I deliberately chose Doty because of the socioeconomic status of Worcester and one of the things that is just hardest part about budgeting, and I so appreciate that you said it, and I get the way it feels about it, is would I love to have a full-time nurse? Yes. Would I love to have a full-time counselor? Yes. Would I love to have Spanish? Yes. Would I love to have all these things for the children of Doty? Yes, absolutely I would. And I understand that the current model is inefficient, and the per pupil cost at a small school like Doty is higher. And that if I'm raising the tax base, if I'm providing all those services under the current model, I'm only increasing the taxes that my community needs to pay. I'm only increasing the stress that my students are already under, and my families are already under. And so it's just holding that tension there. And I just so, first of all, I just have to thank you for pointing that out, because that is absolutely the stress of budgeting and, and I thank you for that very much. Thank you. Okay. We're almost done. Everybody can fall asleep.
So uh, I think we might just, uh, I, I'm just going to table the strategic plan update because I think we wouldn't do justice to it. Uh, and we'll go back. We'll back to that if everybody's okay with mm -hmm. that. Yeah. All right. We need a motion already. I don't think so. I guess this would be official, sure. I don't know. Well, you would have done it at the beginning of the meeting is when you would have done That's true. Yeah, that's true. So let's just. Your discussion of the strategic plan update could be read the update in the cold report. Yeah, that's true. Just read the, read, read the update in the cold report and make sure to read the 3.0. Core beliefs, uh, which are actually are, which are actually in it, and they look like this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and then the district clerk. I'm looking for a motion to appoint Melissa to I will make a motion. Daniel is making a motion. Do you want to second that, sir? Oh, yeah, I was just going to nominate Melissa Teller for our school district clerk. Excellent choice, Daniel. Daniel moves. We won't ask about Maggie's second. Maggie had second, sorry. Oh, sorry. Did you get that, Lisa? So, for school district clerk? Yeah, I have the Washington Central School District. district. Okay. Any discussion? Besides, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. We really appreciate it. Yeah. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries. I'm looking for a motion to approve the minutes. I move to approve the okay. minutes of October 18th and November 1st, 2023. Second. Okay. Jonas and Daniel and uh, oh. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Any discussion? <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> um, on the October 18th minutes, they listed a special school board meeting. I'm pretty sure it was a regular school board meeting. And then I just noticed a consistency thing on where we put our student representatives in one, they're in the others section, and on the mm -hmm. other one, they're in the board members. So just. But they should be one. part of the board member. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Where did it say other? Um, on October 18th, student representatives Willow and Lene are listed under others. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they should be up with board members. Yes. Okay. But what's That's, the other thing you said? Oh, the other thing is, is it, it says it's a special school board meeting, but we were a regular meeting. Where did it say? Oh, I see. In the head. Washington Central. Yeah. yeah. Where, 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 okay. where yes, the right, right. October 18th in the heading. Okay. There must be an edit. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay
that would be the, that may be it. Maybe some minor, I can tell you. Um, just a bit. December 6th, it, well, it's, what? Inquiry and content. So we'll be yeah, at East Montpelier. Yeah. East. Yeah. We'll be at East Montpelier. Some strategic planning update so that is timely. Yeah, that's it. And then local presentation by yeah, East Montpelier. Okay. Uh, communication and engagement uh, planning. It's the, that would be in the agenda to the next uh, the next meeting. Uh, DMES. Uh, board reflection. It was hard, but Ursula was on fire. Have one quick. Can I have a motion to go into executive session? I move to enter executive session per VSA 313A1D for the purpose of a student residency request. Chris, we do. I'd like to give a quick update. Who needs to be in it? No, we can do it.